Okay, welcome. Thank you very much, uh, John. Uh, it's great to see you twice in the space of a couple of uh, weeks. We were in another event a few weeks ago. I'm gonna keep my camera off because my kids are back on school and the bandwidth issue is a, a problem here. But um, thank you all very much for coming and joining us here today. Let me start off by acknowledging our key partners without whom none of this would be possible. I'll start with uh, Representative uh, Jenny Kua, Chairperson of the House Committee on Banks and Financial Intermediaries, uh, Deputy Governor Mert Tangonan uh, of the Central Bank, Representative of uh, Senator Sonny Angara, Dr. William Yu, Secure Connections, Mr. Edwin Reyes, BDO Unibank, Mr. Henry Aguada, Aguda, sorry, uh, Unibank and Bankers Association of uh, the Philippines, uh, Ms. Anna Batista Gikash, um, Ms. Isvari Sivlingan, sorry if I mispronounce your name, better than Cash Alliance. I'm trying to, I'm new as John uh, mentioned, and I'm gonna get there in terms of pronouncing names. Please be patient with me and forgive me for mispronouncing your name if I did. Um, welcome also to other partners in government, private sector and civil society. And John mentioned that the press is here. Welcome as well. And thank you for your support in uh, getting the word out there in terms of uh, the activities we're conducting together and the achievement we um, produce in, uh, over the years. Uh, as John mentioned, I represent the United Agency for International Development, or USAID, which is the leading U.S. agency for international development and humanitarian assistance. This year, USAID is proud to celebrate 60 years of helping people around the world to build strong, stronger and more prosperous communities. USAID was founded, as you know, back in 1961 by President John F. Kennedy. The Philippines was one of our very first partner countries. Today, USAID works in more than 100 countries worldwide, but Philippine, Philippines remain a key partner in promoting sustainable and inclusive development in the region. For the past six decades, we have collaborated with the Philippine government, private sector, and local organizations to improve everyday lives, investing more than $5.1 billion towards shared development goals since 1961. I would like to welcome you all to this uh, event this afternoon, uh, titled Forum on Promotion of uh, Digital Payment, organized by USAID and U uh, the UP Public Administration Foundation through the Regulatory Reform Support Program for National Development or Respond Project, and in partnership with the American Chamber of Commerce, or AMCHAM. This forum brings together government representatives and business leaders from across the region and around the world to discuss proposed promotion of Digital Payment Act. This legislation seeks to facilitate the adoption of safe and efficient digital payments, especially among national and local government agencies and corporations. USAID firmly believes that improving people's access to and use of safe and reliable financial services contribute to a better quality of life. Financial inclusion fosters resiliency, uh, empowers all sectors of society and improves human humanitarian outcomes. In the Philippines, USAID started modestly in this space and almost uh, in almost uh, a decade ago, piloting initiatives through a small scaling innovations and mobile money uh, that we refer to as SIMM S -I -M -M project, where we champion financial inclusion through mobile money. Soon after 2015, we launched a bigger program, the ePerso project. We went beyond mobile money and went full scale in the various electronic payment platforms and modalities. 
This support enabled the central bank to facilitate the creation of the national retail payment system and the subsequent clearing houses, which many of uh, many have been using on a regular basis, especially during the pandemic. Some of the ones that come to mind, uh, PesoNet and uh, Instant Pay. Beyond that, we are happy to have supported the digitization of the Bureau of Internal Revenue System, conducted digital entrepreneurship training for hundreds of uh, women entrepreneurs with the Department of Trade and Industry, and helped develop the systems for uh, the Department of Social Welfare and Development to electronic, electronically distribute cash transfers during the early part of the pandemic. To quote BSP Governor Benjamin uh, Junko, Junk, Junkno, the six year partnership resulted in concrete and pioneering project geared toward promoting financial inclusion and establishing a safe and efficient payment and settlement system in the country. For this, we want to acknowledge the excellent work of Mr. Mert uh, Tangunan, the previous program lead for of these two projects, who is now Deputy Governor for the Payment and Currency Management at BSP. Fast forward to 2020, the agency released its first ever digital strategy, which charts an agency-wide vision of development and humanitarian assistance in the world's rapidly evolving digital landscape, with the end goal of achieving and sustain an open, secure, and inclusive dig digital ecosystem that contributes to broad-based, broad measurable development and humanitarian assistance outcomes and increased self-reliance in emerging market countries. The COVID-19 pandemic has further underscored the need to adopt the digital financial services and enable remote and uh, uh, contactless pay payments has become a uh, has become a vital to the health and safety of communities, from remote barangays to the high rises of uh, Makati and DGC. USAID recognizes the effort of the Philippine government to build an enabling environment for Filipinos to maximize the economic potential of the country. The passage of the bill will be an important component as the country navigates through the ever-changing context of the pandemic and attempts to recover as quickly as possible. We are also pleased that AmCham has thrown its advocacy muscle behind this important reform. USAID will continue to support such initiatives as a friend, partner, and ally. This afternoon, I'm looking forward to the presentation of digital payments bill. Um, in closing, please allow me to congratulate our friends from AMCHAM and UP Public Administration Foundation for collaborating with us in this forum. I look forward to a productive session today. Maraman Salat Po, thank you very much for your attention. John, over to you. Thank you very much, Mohammed. That's a great stream, uh, scene setter for an ambitious program of, of, of speakers that we have today. Uh, we also uh, have uh, invited our friend, Dr. Henry Vasilio, who's the chief of party of the USAID Respond Project that <clears throat> is uh, being implemented by the University of Philippine Public Administration Foundation. Um, uh, Henry is a, an old friend uh, that we've worked together uh, all the way back to a, uh, a round table on manufacturing and logistics that we did. That was the basis for the Aaron Cotta document that was published in, in 2010. And uh, we've worked together uh, pretty much on and off on, on these issues over the last decade. Uh, so Henry, uh, welcome uh, to uh, this uh, event today. Okay, um, thank you, uh, John, and uh, good afternoon. Uh, I will keep my remarks uh, short so that we'll have more time for the presentations and op open forum. But uh, let me start by uh, welcoming again, uh, everyone to this afternoon's forum and uh, say a little more about the RESPOND project. Uh, RESPOND, as I mentioned by Mr. Dansoko, stands for Regulatory Reform Support Program for National Development. 
and is being implemented by the UP Public Administration Research and Services Foundation and supported definitely by the United States Agency for International Development. And the overall goal of our response is to improve the environment for trade and investment by making the economy more open and competitive. So together with our uh, advocacy partner, the American Chamber, of course, uh, uh, our partner here is uh, John Forbes, we push for policy and uh, regulatory reforms to enhance market competition, improve regulatory quality and governance. No? Uh, because of the pandemic, we are fast tracking our transition to the so-called uh, digital economy. And uh, part of the challenge is to improve our ICT infrastructure, but equally important, is to ensure that we have a conducive policy environment that will support our digital transactions, especially digital payments. Uh, this is why uh, we thought of having this forum focus on the promotion of uh, digital payments. Uh, we have uh, very distinguished uh, speakers lined up for this uh, afternoon's forum. I looked at the uh, invite uh, poster, and I'm happy to see old friends no, in the panel, uh, Deputy Governor Mert Tangwanan of uh, BSP and my former student in graduate school, uh, Hetty Aguda. Um, so I'm very excited uh, to listen to their presentations. Uh, let me stop here and uh, turn over the floor back to my partner, John Forbes. Thank you. Salamat, Henry. Thank you very much. Um, now, I am being assisted today by uh, the co-chairs of two AmCham committees, uh, both Rambit Co of our uh, <clears throat> Financial Services Committee and uh, Ricky Salvador of our uh, ICT uh, committee. So I want to ask for the, uh, uh, the next introductions to shift over to Rambit. Uh, we're not going to go immediately to the author of the bill in the House because he's still in a budget hearing in the House, that's Juni Kua, but we'll skip ahead a little bit in the program and uh, Congressman Kua will join us at 2 p.m. So Rambit, over to you. Thank you, John, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Again, my name is Rambit Ko. I co-chair AmChem's Financial Services and Taxes and Tariffs Committee. Please allow me to introduce uh, the good senator who has provided us with a recorded message. So, Senator Juan Edgardo Sani Angara is among the most hardworking and productive members of Congress, having sponsored or authored more than 200 laws in his nearly two decades of service as a legislator. Senator Sunny represented the Aurora province for three terms in the House of Representatives between 2004 and 2013, before he was elected to his first term as a senator in 2013. As a member of Congress, Sunny has worked to widen access to education, improve healthcare services throughout the country, ensure sustainable jobs and decent working conditions, to champion women, protect senior citizens and persons with disabilities, and assist the informal sector. Senator Sunny is author of Senate Bill 1764, the Use of Digital Payments Bill, and he chairs the Senate Bank Subcommittee, which held a hearing on the bill last September 6. Senator Angara is a graduate of Xavier School, the London School of Economics and Political Science, the University of the Philippines College of Law, and Harvard Law School. He has been a regular newspaper columnist and a professor of law. Over and out to the screen with Senator Angara's uh, recorded message. Thank you. Hello, greetings to the attendees of this afternoon's special reform discussion on digital payments. Uh, my thanks go out to John Forbes and the AmCham for giving me the opportunity to speak briefly about our bill, Senate Bill 1764 on or the Digital Payments Act. It's a counterpart measure to the bill filed 
uh, on e-payments by Congressman Joet Garcia of Bataan. Uh, well, the pandemic has accelerated uh, the use of digital platforms and we filed uh, this bill to ride on that momentum precisely and to uh, fully accelerate that uh, transformation as possible. And the bill mandates uh, uh, government agencies, even government corporations and local government units to utilize digital payment platforms in the performance of their governmental functions like the collection of taxes, uh, fees and tolls, uh, revenues, as well as the payments of goods and services and other disbursements. Uh, the measure allows them to include in their respective budgets amounts needed to shoulder uh, the so-called merchant discount rates or processing feeds and fees. Uh, and uh, there's an emphasis on interoperability between different platforms. We've sought to emphasize interoperability between the different platforms of uh, payment providers and the Banco Central or the central bank is called to accelerate the adoption among stakeholders of uh, certain standards. And uh, among the issues raised uh, are the need for a transition period to allow uh, uh, certain actors to adapt, uh, maybe MSMEs or smaller entrepreneurs, the need for capacity building and information, uh, clarification on who pays the fees, uh, issuance of electronic receipts, how, how to go about it, grievance mechanisms, data privacy and security, among others. Uh, I'm sure uh, there's much to be learned from best practices uh, here and abroad and in the private sector in particular, and uh, we look forward to hearing from uh, your members uh, who have, uh, I'm sure, much experience in this regard. So once more, thank you very much uh, for allowing me the opportunity. All the best. So let me turn back to Rambut because we're still waiting for, well, let me first of all greet our ED. Uh, you're with us. Uh, we're just st really starting. We've done all the greetings. Now we're getting into the, the meat of the affair. Uh, uh, Congressman Kua is delayed until two o'clock. Uh, Rambut, do you know who you're calling on next? Um, well, um, is uh, Henry Aguda here or? I, I, I don't see him yet, I think. Uh, uh, hi, uh, Mr. Ko, um, Mr. Agudo will come in at 1.45, so uh, we can have Mr. Yu uh, to... Okay, next. all right. Uh, Dr. Got Yu, it sorry. Then. Yes. So our next uh, speaker will be Dr. William Yu. Dr. Yu is a technology professional and researcher who is a passionate advocate of shaping internet and technology policy. William is part of Secure Connections, a cybersecurity project of the Asia Foundation Philippines. He also runs technology for MDI Novare, working on various projects involving digital transformation, elastic infrastructure, and end-to-end -end agile DevOps. Dr. Yu is an active advocate of shaping internet and technology policy working with organizations such as the Internet Society, PHCERT, PPCRV, and the Department of Information and Communications Technology, or the ITC. He is a teacher at heart and continues to lecture at the Ateneo de Manila University. Dr. Yu, you have the screen. Thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, introduction. And thank you very much to AmCham as well for inviting me to speak briefly during this event. And as uh, Senator Angara mentioned in his welcome uh, uh, message, the two key things that I would like to talk about is basically safety in this digital payments in, uh, ecosystem. And of course the interoperability portion. And that's why I highlighted the word safe and ecosystem in this presentation. 
right? So to start off, just a quick introduction of who we are. So we are Secure, uh, Secure Connections. We are a coalition of cybersecurity stakeholders, right? We are composed of various experts that specialize in different areas of cybersecurity, and we aim to and we aim to improve the general cybersecurity posture of the Philippines. So we want to have a more cyber secure Philippines. And as mentioned in, may, in many news articles and many um, uh, parts of the media, it is quite clear that this digital payments boom that we're facing right now is also an attractive target, for example, for a lot of bad actors in the market, right? So we are, far, we are funded by the Asia Foundation, right? Which is a nonprofit international development organization that's committed to improving lives across dynamic and developing Asia. Right. So uh, we are a team of sector and policy experts, as I mentioned uh, a while ago. Right. So our, our work in the Philippines seeks to better promote governance, spur economic growth, strengthen rule of law, and foster peace and development in Mindanao. So that is the focus of the Asia Foundation. And I'd like to thank them for sponsoring our initiative as well. Okay, so first off, let us talk about today's landscape. So. As, uh, as the first speaker, I have the privilege of showing a more digital world, but I am pretty sure many of the speakers later on will show us how we've moved and how we have embraced digital in this time of pandemic and lockdown. So just a few statistics that come, uh, come to mind. Uh, here, for example, 55.8 million people are the number of people who have done di digital payments right in the last year. So that's more, uh, that's a little bit, or that's slightly more than half of the population of the country. The value is now estimated to be $15 billion. 43% uh, is uh, basically the usage of enabled digital personal finance, so 43% of people, and 76% of people have bought something online, right? And 91% have actually visited a store, so at least the window shopping online is quite pervasive as well. And they have bought uh, with their laptops 28%, which is much less, and 66% with mobile. So definitely the mobile and digital opportunity is there. And people have adopted technology quite readily in this time of lockdowns. Now, of course, uh, we are happy and we are supportive of the digital payments bill that is being proposed in both houses of Congress, because we would like to also ensure that even government and public sector payments, fees, and taxes can be done digitally as well, okay? Of course, there are digital opportunities when things become digital, right? So, uh, but there are still, let's just say, there's still room for growth, right? So only 30% actually have an account in the financial institution, so we have a ways to go. Credit card penetration is quite low. Uh, mobile money account, despite the traction that we've made so far, is still quite, uh, it has, still has room to grow. This is already quite large, but it has room to grow. And of course, the ability to make all online payment uh, purchases still at the uh, a rate that can be improved. Now, there are also some items in terms of who owns what in terms of gender inequality and the like, but this is basically a, just a rough snapshot of the digital opportunities or areas for improvement. So it's definitely we can do more and we can make it more pervasive. Now, with any opportunity, there are also new risks. So here are examples of some of the digital risks. I purposely chose sample risks that are outside the country, but definitely there are cases of this in country as well. So for example, hackers that, that are breaching the colonial pipeline, right? So it's a key piece of e e e infrastructure in the United States for bringing gas to particular locations has been all compromised with ransomware, for example, and which caused an outage, right? At the same time, we have some issues like here, uh, in the case uh, it's a ransomware attack on the Axie division here in the Asia Pacific region. Dubai had, uh, had a case, for example, which is bank account hacking case, which is uh, quite large because of the size of the ba bank account and many, many more. The, the problems with respect to information security have gotten so bad that the United States uh, and the executive branch have released an executive order specifically calling on to improve national cybersecurity. Now this Biden executive order has been very, um, let's just say it's one of the more prescriptive executive orders we've actually seen. It even pushes specific technologies like zero trust and um, e EDR and the like, and which makes the, and cloud as well, and it makes them uh, like uh, 
uh, a recommendation with respect to national government agencies or federal agencies in the case of the United States. Now, at the same time, the risks here in the Philippines in aggregate, right, the average spend for an organization to respond to ransomware, a fairly large one, would be 40 M. And just to say that I've worked with certain organizations to, to help them with their ransomware problems. In some cases, the number is actually larger than this, right? And uh, there's an increase also in the number of firms hit by ransomware as an absolute number. Uh, there was a study as well by Kaspersky that there are 55,000 password stealers detected in the country. That means these are machines or laptops or mo mo mobile phones that have malware installed. And just as an anecdote in the uh, online voting dry run, which, ha ha uh, which happened last weekend, out of the 600 participants, 20 participants were found to have malware and were not allowed to do the, uh, the, the online voting pilot until they cleaned up that malware. So that's how pervasive malware is as well in this country. Uh, in terms of ransomware, this is a global average because I couldn't find the Philippine number. So the average ra ransomware payout is about 170,000 US dollars. So definitely there are risks because with these risks come with the opportunities. Now, here is what we are, um, uh, we would like to remind our e ecosystem and partners. We, we, we want to build something safe. We want to build a safe ecosystem. And at the same time, we want to protect this ecosystem. So first off the safe, with this is with respect to information security and data privacy. So we would uh, propose, and this is, these are our recommendations with the current form of the bill, is basically that all systems and technologies used must ensure proper information security and data privacy controls are in place. Now data privacy tends to be put in attention because we have a law specifically for that, but information security and minimum standards is something we would like to push. The same time, BSP already has rules, has quite a substantial amount of rules and regulations with respect to banks and BSP mandated financial institutions, which we would like to also apply to payment processors, right? So for example, BSP already has a circular A808, for example, which de uh, uh, describes a number of information security, technology risk management guidelines per se, and the all important uh, circular 1019 which is uh, reporting uh, guidelines as well. Because part of the challenge we have with respect to information security today is the lack of good information with respect to the scope and size of the problem, right? So for th things like this, because of the circular, we actually make reporting mandatory. Now in terms of ecosystem, we, uh, as the good Senator mentioned in his recorded message, we would like to promote interoperability and standards. It is also, um, it is important that we, Co consider digital payments and we allow people to get access to the financial systems through that technology. But at the same time, we want to build an e e e ecosystem where partners, players, merchants, and consumers can interact with each other. And our proposal for this is basically to drive towards standards. Now, this is not unique to the Philippines. We have seen movements globally with respect to use of interoperable, uh, interoperable standards. So first is the e uh, European Union PSD2 guidelines, which are nicknamed open banking guidelines, which have been promoted in the European Union. At the same time here in the Philippines, we have the Philippine e-government interoperability framework. This is mostly for public sector, where the, uh, the DIC, uh, the office of the president through the DICT mandates and encourages government institutions, both national, and local to adopt interoperable and open standards. And at the same time, there is a draft uh, circular that BSP is, uh, has already published actually, which is, which is with respect to their open finance framework. So we feel that with open banking, open finance, and the Philippine government interoperability framework, there are many standards in which we can uh, define uh, levels of interoperability. Now, uh, 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 now, at the same time, we also highly encourage that uh, participants in this ecosystem try to use as many standards as possible to ensure maximum interoperability between the players. In summary, what we would like to recommend as secure core connections, and I think most of our recommendations have been uh, adopted in the current draft bill, so we'd like to thank Congress for that. 
So first is basically ensure that all data and information and information technology systems and networks used for digital payments should remain secure and protected. So it should be a highlight. So any digital initiative in government, we would like to make sure that it, information security is part and parcel of that, in this case, digital payments. The second one is establish and implement minimum information security standards. Now, the nice thing about the financial in, in industry, as it's regulated by the Banco Central ng Filipinas, is that there are standards that the BSP has proposed. So for example, their circulars can serve as the minimum standards for this particular industry. And third is, of course, mandate the use of open standards and protocols, right? There are many standards that can be used as a framework. There is our own internal Philippine e-government interoperability framework for the public sector. And there is BSP's open finance framework, which is being drafted specifically for the financial sector as well. Now, the good thing about interoperability is it also ensures preservation of data. Again, we don't want to be held hostage to proprietary data formats where we buy a system and put our data there and suddenly when the vendor doesn't want to support us anymore, the data is locked because it's a proprietary format. So we have to look at these open standards and open protocols as well. And last but not the least, not directly related per se, but we would also like to push for the passage of the Open Access in Data Transmission Act to provide an enhanced environment for improving internet connectivity to support digital payments. Part of, uh, uh, part of the comments that we have been hearing from various sectors is that there is a substantial digital divide that still needs to be bridged. The updated DICT ICT household survey clearly shows that when an area has digital uh, sufficient internet call or connectivity, the adoption of digital technology is also higher. So that points towards an opportunity where areas that have air, uh, for areas that need improvement in terms of digital connectivity have, have, have the opportunity or remain open opportunities for enhancing digital finance or use of digital technologies. All right, so that, that is it for my presentation today. Uh, thank you very much. Magandang hapon at salama. Back to you. William, thank you very much for that. Um, one comment I would make is that open access, we agree with you uh, <clears throat> that that's an important reform, except we have the, the, while the House has passed it, the Senate has not even had a hearing yet. Uh, so it's very important that uh, all of our organizations call on the House to, uh, uh, to hold a hearing and to move that through. Uh, I think if the PSA thank bill you. actually uh, approves opening up telcos to 100% foreign owner ownership that um, may impact positively on, on uh, the prospects for open access. Uh, That's a Rambut? good point, John, and thanks for the support. Uh, Rambut, are, do you have another person to introduce at this point? We've had presentations from Senator Angara and from Dr. Yu, and we're still not, okay. uh, um, we're not, we're still waiting for uh, until two o'clock for uh, both uh, Representative Kua and then the Deputy <clears throat> Governor to join us. Uh, hi. Um, uh, next, since we're also still waiting for uh, Mr. Henry Aguda to come in, uh, may we request Attorney Ricky Salvador to introduce Ms. Anna Bautista from, B from GCash as our next speaker. Great. Ricky, can you do that? Sure, John. Good afternoon. It's my privilege no, as the uh, co-chair of the ICT Committee of the American Chamber of Commerce in the Philippines to introduce our next speaker. Our next speaker is uh, Ms. Anna Bautista. She is the head of conglomerates and the retail cluster enterprise group, GCash. Anna has been in GCash for over three years and is part of the enterprise group, handling partners from conglomerates, retail and financial institutions. She previously worked in an international foreign bank specializing in wealth management with the accelerated shift to digitalization brought about by events the past year, Anna and her team in GCash work to ensure partners are equipped to face the current challenges of the present and new normal beyond. Anna, you have the floor. Thank you very much for the introduction. I just wanted to ask if you can hear me properly. 
Yes. All right. Thank you very much. Okay, so let me just share my screen. Okay, so good afternoon again, everyone. Thank you very much for taking the time to be here to listen to us today. And I'm very honored to be here to represent GCash. So again, I'm Anna Bautista. And today, allow me to walk you through the story of GCash through the years. So for those of you who haven't yet use Gcash or experienced it, perhaps you may have come across someone say, just Gcash it. So similar to how uh, Google has become somewhat like a verb and how we always uh, use Google whenever we need to search for information and you say, just Google it, Gcash has somewhat become something like a verb as well. You may have uh, asked someone to make a payment and the person may have just said, just Gcash it. So, I wanted to also talk a little bit about how we came to be who we are today. Through the years, Gcash has grown through several life stages. So what was in 2005, just a mere USSD function for remittance services has then blossomed to become the first e-wallet in the Philippines in 2012. And moving on to 2015, we have actually spun off from Globe our parent company, to establish Mint and Fuse. Mint being our holdings company and Fuse being our lending arm. It was in 2017 that we had a very big investor that would be Ant Financial, who is the fintech arm of the giant multinational tech company that you may know as Alibaba of China. They brought with them, of course, their experience in e-wallets across the region. So following all those years, we really worked to introduce groundbreaking services to both individuals and businesses alike, starting off, of course, at the very core, the very core need, which would be to make everyday payments and transfers. So this would be the likes of sending money, uh, bank transfer, paying bills, and after which to be able to integrate with their lifestyles, such as shopping, and lastly, to be a part of their financial needs such as investing, saving, and borrowing. Today, with over 46 million users, that would be roughly around 40% of the population, our customer adoption would be in the stages of early and late majority. Those who have probably followed already the innovators and early adopters and would be more at ease in trying out products that have already been tried and tested. But still, with even a big percent um, even though we have already around 40% of the population, we still see that a big percent still remain unbanked or underbanked. And our vision of finance for all remains aligned with the target of the central bank to convert 50% of total volume of retail payments into digital form. And by expanding the financially included to 70% of Filipino adults. So this is the target by 2023. Back in, in 2017 and 2018, we encouraged early adopters through revolutionary breakthrough. I remember three years ago when we would be introducing QR codes to our partner merchants and uh, companies, they were still quite skeptical about the technology. They were, they were a bit wary about how it would work, if it was safe, but when they actually tried it and tested it, they realized how convenient and effective it was. And then there was really no turning back after that. And it was, it was that year that we continued to scale to around 30,000 QR merchants in just a span of one to two years. We also introdu introduced G-Credit, which is our micro loan facility, uh, which we offer to our regular users the opportunity to borrow money to pay for their short-term expenses. And lastly, we also introduced EKYC, which, uh, wherein customers could then already open and fully register, fully verify their accounts just via the, the Gcash app. Prior to this, there was still a leg where customers would still need to submit forms and wait for an agent to give them a call. In 2019, we had a very strong push to introduce relevant and accessible financial services. So with the likes of our partnership with Instapay, where we are able to 
uh, customers are able to easily transfer funds to banks real time. Of course, this uh, opens up access to everyone. And we also introduced GSAVE, which is our bank account within the GCash app, where customers can do not need to maintain a minimum balance and have a very attractive interest rate. We also launched G-Invest, which is our investment facility, and we are currently partnered with APR Asset Management. And also, we did, in, we also launched G-Forest, which is our initiative to encourage people to switch to green activities to reduce waste and carbon consumption. So the more a person uses Gcash, he will be getting energy points, which will then convert into a virtual tree. And from that virtual tree, we will commit, Gcash commits to plant a real tree in, in different watersheds. So it was that year where we reached 20 million registered Gcash users. Uh, in a span of six months, we did get 500,000 enrollments into Gsave and 3 million Geek Forest participants in just one year. The second uh, tipping point was really 2020. Of course, we know that last year was quite the challenging year it was. We did see that it, we hit a 9.5% GDP drop, which was the worst fall rate since World War II. And we also saw a 10% unemployment rate that left around 5 million people jobless and 26% MSMEs closed during the lockdown. So it was very challenging for everyone, although Gcash has really helped to move the economy, move, uh, to help move the economy forward. For example, we partnered with government's LGUs, DSWD, LTFRB, uh, to be able to disperse to beneficiaries the cash aid. So we disperse a total of around 16 billion worth to 2 million Filipinos. At the same time, we also came up with donation drives, partnering with very big foundations, the likes of Philippine Red Cross, ABS-CBN, Lincoln Capamilia, UNICEF, World Vision. And we were able to come up with 40 million worth of donations for COVID and the super typhoon victims. Last year, we, we ended the year with 33 million GCash registered users, and we also had 2.2 million social sellers. So these would be your favorite Instagram sellers, Facebook sellers, those who have mom and pop stores, uh, and you're able to actually purchase from them. And we also ended the year with 1,000 times transaction growth and GTV value worth 1 trillion. Of course, though, however, I, I would want to note that it was really through the partnerships of the private sector and the government that we have really been able to increase our sales, sorry, our scale of users and their influence in employees and citizen, citizens to go digital is really crucial in the move to digital. Okay, so 2021, which is this year, we continue to expand and engage Filipinos across different touch points as a way of life. So today, we have, well, a few months back, we have launched G-Life, which is our digital marketplace, and Ad Tech, which is our digital ads within the app. So with these products and services, we aim to be able to provide access to our users and at the same time, help our partners grow their reach. So what's interesting to note is that we have around 13 to 15 million logins in the app daily. And we have an average of two times. Uh, our average is two times that they transact. So for every user that's active daily, they would be logging into the app and maybe perhaps paying a bill and then perhaps sending money to a friend. Uh, so we have expanded. Um, we continue to expand, and this year we are already uh, at 46 million, and this continues to grow. We have 150 partners in G Life. Uh, we have a wide array of um, industries there, whether it's food, retail, healthcare, financial services. They're all in the app. And we've also expanded to uh, tricycle drivers and wet markets. So if you see in this, uh, in, in, 
when you're taking a tricycle or you go to the wet market and they have QR codes, they are also enabled already. We have around 8,000 tricycle drivers with QR codes and around 3,500 wet market vendors. We are trending to hit 3 trillion in gross transaction value. So you may ask now, what is next and what is the future for Gcash? So we're looking to provide more digital financial services for our customers with the likes of having cash loans uh, of up to 25,000 pesos with an interest rate of 2 to 4% per month. We are looking to also increase our portfolio of insurance coverages. Uh, right now, we see that a lot of people request for COVID-19 and dengue insurance. So we have those in the app, but we're looking to, add, to increase our portfolio. And we also have investment portfolios that allow users to participate in the growth of global and local companies. So currently, we do have around five uh, funds in the, in the platform, but we're looking to also increase this to further diversify. But furthermore, I also want to note here that we want to be able to expand uh, beyond just the metros. Today, Gcash is most prevalent in NCR and in Luzon, but we're looking to continue expansion in the Visayas and Mindanao regions. The second is I we would want to be able to have strong collaborations with both public and private sectors to increase digital adoption. So we believe by having very solid partnerships, we envision to grow our cashless ecosystems across multiple industries. I have listed here a few of the industries we have engagements with, but this list continues to grow. With them, we talk about various B2B solutions that can help transform their offices, their workplaces, their entire ecosystems to become cashless, whether it's from payroll disbursements or collection of payments or acceptance online. We really have the whole uh, suite in order to help them become more digital. It is also... Sorry, so uh, we, the past years, what we've really seen is how the biggest companies, conglomerates, and organizations really have the power to help and, uh, to help and uh, inspire employees, customers, vendor, partners, agents, all of them to transact digitally. These companies with their reach and influence can definitely make a difference in mindset. And truly, this is the kind of support that helps us reach our goals. We believe that the digital payment bill will further pave the way to a more digital nation. We see it as a very positive move to fast, as it will fast track and encourage the nation to work towards a common goal. It's also through the support of our regulators who, continue, who continuously come up with improvements such as the QR code interoperability that businesses and individuals will have more ease in transacting digitally. And we also want to continue working with companies that help provide more touch points to our fellow men, uh, such as partner aggregators like Dynamics, EasyPay, Body, and the like. To sum it all up, Although Gcash has scaled through the years, it's important and very crucial to continue getting support from the government and the private sector. We remain very dedicated and committed in our goals to make the, the nation more digital. This ends my presentation today, and I hope I have somehow shed light in introducing who Gcash is, and also to make known to you that we are in with, we are with you in this vision for digitalization. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anna. Sorry, John, go ahead. Uh, I, well, Anna, thank you very much. I, Anna helped me out when she was at Citibank many years ago, so I'm glad to see your career progress, and that was an excellent presentation. Thank you, uh, John. I saw Eb Hinscliffe uh, trying to figure out if he can get members to pay their dues over GCash, right? <laughs> um, 
I, uh, Randall, has Congressman Kua come on? Or the uh, yes, sir. Um, I'd like to apologize to Mr. Aguda, but uh, maybe we can have Congressman Kua next first, since uh, he will be presenting also more on the bill itself, so that it can also help set for the other speakers after him. Well, and um, uh, Attorney Ricky Salvador will be um, introducing uh, Congressman okay. I Kua. just say if there are any speakers that may have to, we, we don't want to lose anybody, so if any speakers would advise Randall if they have to leave early or something, and we'll coordinate this. So, uh, Ricky, over to you, please. Thank you, John. So it's my privilege to introduce our next speaker uh, to talk about the promotion of digital payments bill in the House. Our next speaker is the Chairman, uh, Committee on Banks and Financial Intermediaries. Representative Juni Kuwa is the representative Loan District of Quirino of the House of Representatives. He is one of the veteran lawmakers of the House of Representatives, having served in the 8th, 9th, 10th, 12th, 13th and 14th Congre Congresses. He was instrumental in crafting and passing landmark measures such as the Cheaper Medicines Law and the Strengthened CARP Law. A former governor for nine years, he had been acknowledged as the architect of Quirino's development. He successfully united the political leaders of the province from the barangay to the municipal up to the provincial level. Together, they introduced innovations to the province in terms of providing quality services. As governor, he was able to source out funds from national agencies and other organizations that helped in the improvement of the province. As chairperson of the Committee on Banks and Intermediaries in the 18th Congress, he shepherded the passage of House Bill 8992, the promotion of digital payments bill. He is also vice chairperson of the committees on appropriations, economic affairs, and natural resources, and member of the majority for the committees on basic education and culture, constitutional amendments, ecology, indigenous cultural communities, and indigenous peoples, public order and safety, trade and industry and transportation. Ladies and gentlemen, um, let me uh, hand, uh, turn it over to our esteemed speaker, Representative Juni Kuwa. Uh, thank you uh, so much. Uh, first, of, first of all, allow me to express my, my thanks to, uh, to everyone for giving me an opportunity to join you today and uh, shed light on the uh, on a bill uh, that is considered to be a priority of, uh, uh, of uh, the government. And uh, this is an act to promote the use of digital payments for financial transactions of government and all merchants. And uh, uh, thank you for, uh, by the way, thank you uh, very much for that uh, wonderful and very generous introduction. Uh, my, my, uh, my dear partners in, uh, in, uh, in developing the Philippine economy, uh, and the American Chamber of, uh, Commerce, uh, uh, thank you so much uh, for the opportunity. Uh, I understand that, uh, my... My uh, purpose for being invited today is more on uh, talking about the prospect of the passage of this bill rather than the, uh, the details, uh, the objectives, and the key provisions of this bill as this has been uh, presented in an earlier uh, in an earlier meeting that, uh, that I have attended. Uh, so without much ado, uh, in, in the interest of time, I uh, understand that there is a very limited time uh, for this presentation and hopefully if there are questions, we can address them. 
So uh, I I have only one slide to capture and present to you uh, the the timeline that we have, and uh, from that be able to give you uh, an idea of uh, the likelihood of the passage of this bill. Uh, let me begin by, uh, by informing you that uh, this bill was uh, approved way back uh, in March 25, uh, 2021 in the House of Rep Representatives, um, mm, approved on third reading and uh, transmitted to the Senate during the uh, second quarter of this year. And uh, I understand that uh, the bill is uh, in the Senate Committee on Banks. And I'd like to highlight uh, the more important, uh, the more important information that there are only 32, 32 uh, remaining session days from today until February 4. And I have, uh, and I have uh, uh, here a, a timeline uh, that, uh, that shows that. Uh, this is our official calendar. Uh, uh, for the third regular session, I have uh, I have highlighted in a box the the uh, the the calendar of our commencement of session last uh, July 20, 26 when the president gave the state of the nation address, and uh, we are to adjourn by the end of this month. Starting on the 23rd of this month, uh, the House of Representatives will be busy with the budget. But in the meantime, uh, the Senate, uh, 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 the Senate can still work on this bill. Uh, however, I understand that uh, the status in the Senate is that the the Senate Committee. Uh, has organized a technical working group to work on the on the bill, and my understanding is that there is no substantial uh, differences in the House and the Senate versions. But of course, that version can change uh, during the process of technical working group meetings and during the deliberations at the committee level and uh, at the plenary. So, so that means to say, uh, after the end of this month, um, when, we, when we resume in, uh, in November 8th, uh, all the way up to February 4th, th that is the only window that is available for the Senate uh, to work on the bill and uh, for us to go into bicameral conference meetings if necessary, uh, uh, assuming that there are major differences. But uh, sometimes what happens is that if there is no substantial differences between the House and the Senate version, we dispense with the bicam and we just agree uh, one house or the other will adopt the version, and that should save us a, uh, a lot more time and uh, have it signed by the president before the adjournment of this Congress. So I have, uh, I have presented the timeline, maybe uh, uh, for the benefit of the, of the members of the chamber, uh, you, can, uh, you can have this and uh, see and monitor how, how, how things would progress from now till, uh, till the end of this, uh, 
of these remaining days of, uh, of this uh, regular session. So, <clears throat> so there is still a great chance. I hope that uh, this, uh, this bill can, we, will pass. Uh, it really depends on uh, uh, how fast uh, the Senate would be able to manage this because uh, after we would have transmitted the budget to the Senate, then they will also become busy with the budget. But before they take that up, I think there is still some, uh, some spaces there and uh, there is still a window of opportunity for its uh, passage in the Senate. So that's my, uh, my humble uh, assessment and evaluation of the prospect of the passage of this uh, very important bill. Thank you so much. Uh, Kong, jo Kong Juni, John Forbes here. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Hi, John. thank you for joining us again today. Um, You're welcome. I'm sure, did you watch the hearing that Senator Angara had last week? Because there were several hundred people there. I'm sure you have a report from your staff that uh, there are a lot of technical issues. And he just gave us a, uh, uh, a short uh, video welcome uh, uh, 45 minutes ago, and he listed a number of them. Uh, so the, the, that hearing concluded uh, with moving the bill into a TWG. So. I, I think the pace at which the TWG moves will be critical, given the short number of days remaining that you just uh, gave us the information on. So I guess we collectively should encourage uh, technical issues to stay out of the bill, uh, to keep the bill as close to the original that was passed uh, in the House, uh, so that you could have a minimal bicam if the Senate can even get it out uh, into plenary. But we certainly, I think, can commit to you that we will um, en encourage the Senate to proceed that way. Thank you. Thank you, John, uh, for, uh, for that uh, statement. And uh, rest assured that uh, we in the House will uh, we'll always keep an open mind and uh, uh, technical issues should not really get on the way of agreement. Uh, These uh, technical concerns may very well be, be, be addressed uh, oftentimes in the, in the implementation stage when uh, IRR uh, is being crafted. So um, Sunny, uh, uh, Sunny and I had a very nice working relationship. We work on many many bills, including the, the vaccine bill, a vaccine law. So uh, he's easy to work with. And uh, we always uh, are ready to, to support uh, whatever we can uh, do in uh, facilita facilitating the discussion in the Senate. We, we, our records are, uh, are always available for them to, to to look into uh, if somehow they would be of great of help to them. Well, we, we have 150 participants in this uh, <clears throat> webinar today, including the media. So I hope our media friends will also assist us in, in various ways by reporting on this and perhaps their, uh, some of their columnists in the newspapers uh, discussing how important this bill is. Uh, because uh, it is one of the lessons of the pandemic that we all are depending on di efficient digital means in order to make our lives uh, bearable, quite frankly. Uh, so yeah. the world has changed, and we thank you for your authorship and the speed in which the House has uh, passed this bill. If you'll pass those uh, words of gratitude on to Speaker Velasco, we'd appreciate that. You're always welcome, John, and uh, of course, the American Chamber of Commerce. We, we were expecting the uh, Deputy uh, Governor of the BSP to join us, uh, Mert uh, Tunganan. And I don't, uh, Randall, has he been able to come out of the I, Governor's yeah, meeting? Yes, sir. Uh, 
uh, Deputy Governor Tong Onan this year, maybe we can, um, since he was originally supposed to be the second, uh, third okay. speaker, uh, may we request uh, Mr. Rombit Ko to introduce uh, DG Tong Onan. Great. It's great to see the yeah. DG again. Thank you, Randall. I am extremely delighted. and It's an honor to introduce the next speaker, Deputy Governor Mamerto Tangonan, Deputy Governor, Payments and Currency Management Sector of the Banco Central ng Pilipinas. Deputy Governor Mert is the head of the Payments and Currency Management Sector, PCMS, of the Banco Central ng Pilipinas, which is tasked to address the interplay between digital money and physical currency and support the digital transformation of the country's financial services. DG Mert leads PCMS in maintaining the safety and integrity of the Philippine currency, as well as ensuring a well-functioning payments and cash ecosystem that fosters long-term economic growth. He brings with him over 28 years of experience in digital and traditional financial services, telecommunications, technology, financial inclusion, and consulting services. Prior to joining the BSP, DG Mert was chief of party of the USAID ePESO project. DG Mert took his bachelor's degree in civil engineering from the University of the Philippines and his executive MBA from the Asian Institute of Management. DG Mert, you have the screen. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Rombit. Uh, and uh, thank you, uh, John. So first of all, uh, I'd like to uh, say good afternoon to the esteemed guests uh, gathered here in this AmCham uh, meeting, um, um, especially uh, our beloved representative, Juni Kua. Thank you, sir, for uh, authoring the bill on uh, digital payments, promotion of uh, Digital Payments uh, Act. Uh, it's really a big boost to uh, the BSP's effort towards um, further transitioning the economy from uh, uh, being cash heavy to uh, cash light. So um, I was requested to uh, speak on the updates on the digital payments transformation roadmap and also to um, talk about the uh, um, pending uh, bills in both the House and the Senate relating to uh, the Digital Payments uh, Act. So uh, first of all, I'd like to um, describe to you the uh, financial inclusion landscape that has emerged uh, in our country. Um, good news is as of 20. 19, our uh, account, uh, formal account ownership uh, has uh, grown to 29%, coming from 23% uh, two years uh, earlier. That's still a long road. Uh, our objective is really like 70% by 2023. But um, what, what, what this tells us is, is it's um, uh, already uh, uh, showing that we uh, have the right mix uh, towards uh, propelling this number to uh, achieve the uh, objective of 70%. Uh, let, let me just highlight to you some remarkable um, drivers for, for growth of this uh, account ownership. So uh, we saw a 13% um, uh, percentage growth in the account ownership of uh, the socioeconomic class E. So that, that's, that's our base of the pyramid. So it's telling us that uh, this segment of our uh, society is beginning to, number one, they're beginning to realize uh, the importance of, of uh, owning uh, formal accounts. And second, that the financial services providers are beginning to reach them where they were, when they were, where they were uh, previously um, uh, underserved or even uh, unbanked. And uh, it, from, from the data that we saw, uh, we, the, the e electronic money accounts uh, grew by seven percentage points. So what this uh, su su suggesting to us is that um, the, the um, 
uh, those who have uh, uh, recently on board, well, at, uh, as of 2019, those who have uh, onboarded um, um, or were on bo onboarded into owning formal accounts uh, were mostly driven by uh, electronic uh, money. So um, it, it gives us a clue that perhaps the, the uh, ease uh, by which uh, a, a customer can open uh, an e-money account uh, is, is um, suggesting that this is the one, one of the ways to go. And we're happy to note that even banks uh, have already leveraged on uh, electronic KYC and uh, enabled uh, the, the, the public to open accounts uh, purely digitally. So even without visiting a, a bank branch. So this is a, a very positive uh, development that we continue to encourage. And uh, also we observed a, a uh, 300% growth in uh, active electronic money wallets uh, usage. So um, this telling us that uh, not only are people opening uh, electronic money or uh, formal accounts, but they're also uh, using uh, these, these uh, accounts. In fact, the share of uh, account holders who, start, who use their accounts uh, more actively grew from 18% uh, to 39%. Um, so we, we have uh, made great strides in the financial inclusion uh, landscape, but what's even more exciting is the opportunities that lie ahead. Because uh, as we know, 69% of adults are already own a, a mobile uh, phone and, uh, and only 12% uh, uh, of, of them actually use the their digital devices in order to make uh, financial transactions. So this, this uh, on, on, on the supply side uh, uh, market players, this presents a huge opportunity because these customers uh, are already reachable um, and it's, it's a matter of uh, now uh, promoting to them and uh, um, educating them on the value of uh, uh, opening uh, a formal account uh, through the use of their uh, phones. And um, um, uh, much has been said about the digital coverage in the Philippines, but we're happy that uh, at least 53% of, of, uh, of the adults in the Philippines are uh, already uh, on the internet and actively uh, using it. Um, Nonetheless, uh, we have to bear in mind that there's still seven out of 10 uh, uh, adults in the, uh, in the land uh, who have yet to uh, be formally uh, financially included um, by opening a bank account. So moving on to the Philippine digital payments landscape. Um, so after we, we have seen the financial uh, inclusion landscape, uh, what, what this... Um, uh, would tell us is that the, the share of digital payments, the total retail payments transaction volume has been steadily, even I would say uh, remarkably increasing from, from a low base of 1% uh, digital uh, payments usage in, in, um, in 2013. As of last uh, report uh, by the uh, jo joint report by the BST and the Better Than Cash Alliance, uh, covering the first half of uh, first semester of 2020, the, uh, that, that um, figure, that percentage has already recent to uh, 70%. And soon we will be uh, releasing a report uh, covering the whole year of uh, 2020. Um, the important message to us here is that uh, we, we've seen a, especially, um, uh, as induced by, by the uh, uh, pandemic that we're experiencing, um, the, 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 we can clearly see a, a, a shifting uh, trend in, in, the, in the preference of, of uh, our public uh, in terms of um, um, using uh, cash less and using digital payments uh, more. So we want to capitalize uh, on these uh, shifting preference. 
So uh, just to, uh, to recall the digital payments transformation roadmap, because this is the roadmap that we have prepared to, to chart our course towards achieving our objective of 50% uh, 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 digital payments share of total <coughs> payments transaction volume, and also 70% of the Filipino adults financially included. So in, 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 uh, I mean, shortly, I'll be giving you updates on, on these uh, streams. But um, we are, um, I think we have presented this in, in a previous fora um, on how we are uh, um, on the road to achieving uh, those uh, strategic outcomes that I have just uh, mentioned. So on the digital payment streams, um, we have identified that um, what we have now in the market with PesoNet and Instapay is a uh, um, electronic funds transfer uh, service. And um, it, it's great. Um, however, it doesn't, uh, it's not readily uh, appropriate for the other payments, uh, payment needs of, of the public. Example. Uh, it is hardly applicable to say um, uh, use it to to let's say uh, pay pay a merchant, pay your supermarket, or pay your sari sari store, or pay a public stall uh, or a stall in the public market. So um, we have identified uh, mar uh, merchant payments as a key priority use case because out of the total retail payments transaction volume in the country, 70% of these are merchant payments. So um, the other, the other um, um, payment streams that are coming up are utility payments. Um, we, together with the payments industry, will be launching an interoperable uh, digital bills payment uh, uh, service, wherein the uh, customers would be able to pay their billers uh, through their uh, uh, transaction accounts using digital means, uh, even if they don't uh, belong or if they don't uh, use uh, the same financial institution. For example, uh, currently in, in the market, what, what the, 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 what you would see is that if, uh, let's say you want to, to pay um, your billers, you are confined to paying billers who are also um, with the same bank as, as uh, uh, you are. Um, but what we are trying to do is uh, to break down that barrier uh, so that uh, any customer would be able to pay any biller, um, uh, even if they're not uh, with the same bank. Um, so just to, to uh, go back a bit on merchant payments, so what we will be launching here soon, uh, by October of this month, is uh, the QRPH P2M. So it is a low cost uh, merchant payment um, uh, method wherein the customer simply uh, and conveniently just would have to scan the um, QR code of the supermarket or uh, you know a, a pa paste it on, on, on the on the cashier uh, or or even even small and uh, I would even say micro uh, merchants um, because this is a, a low cost um, merchant payment uh, option. So um, apart from these two, we're also um, uh, working to uh, implement uh, supplier payments such that uh, buyers can pay their suppliers using um, um, Pesonet or even uh, Instapay, uh, especially now that uh, the, the country has moved to um, um, a more robust and uh, comprehensive uh, payment messaging standards called uh, based on ISO, ISO 
2022. And of course, remittances, social benefits, we, con we continue to promote that this be done uh, using uh, either PesoNet or uh, InstaPay. And we also have the, what, we, what the industry calls the eGov Pay, uh, which is specifically very useful for uh, paying uh, government. So there are, there are upcoming uh, digital streams. Uh, to be uh, launched uh, next year, including uh, what we call PesoNet multiple batch uh, settlement. So currently, PesoNet settles once a day at four o'clock. So there is a claim morph uh, among the um, public, especially the businesses and also the banks, to to have uh, at, at um, to increase the number of uh, times we settle from one to two. So what, what this means is that um, the, the PesoNet transactions you make uh, in the morning would be able to, I mean, your, your, your recipients would be able to receive them uh, right after lunch. And uh, if you do them uh, later, then your recipients will receive the funds um, at the usual around 5.30 to 6 o'clock. So what this means is that um, the, the uh, suppliers can have uh, more uh, liquidity and hopefully turn that, uh, turn that around uh, faster because they get their payments sooner so they can be um, they're enabled to, to uh, increase their capacity and be more uh, productive. Um, the other is uh, request to pay. So this is a, um, a, a service wherein the collection transaction is initiated not by the customer or payer, but by the merchant or, or the payee. So what, 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 how, how this became successful in other uh, economies is that it, it now shifts the, the, the effort to type you know, the, the um, transaction uh, or to initiate the transaction from the payer to the payee. So it, it makes it more convenient for the payer to uh, to uh, confirm or authorize that that uh, payment, and he is secure, and he uh, that that the, the the details presented to him can and, you know he can verify them uh, prior to confirmation. And uh, last on the DPTR is the direct debit. So uh, this is the most efficient way for billers to collect. Uh, uh, payments from their customers. So uh, here's an example where, uh, let's say a, a customer would trust his uh, utility company and give them the mandate to uh, for that for their monthly bills, be, uh, that it can be debited uh, from, from their uh, account. So this is very uh, it's a popular uh, way of uh, paying bills uh, in, in uh, especially the, the more advanced uh, economies. Um, so all of these uh, presents the, the paying public and, and uh, both individuals, businesses, and government an opportunity to um, um, reduce their cost in terms of uh, both uh, accounts receivable and accounts uh, payable uh, processes, um, as well as uh, um, enabling newer business models to, to, to grow uh, in the market, especially those that are digital, digitally enabled uh, transactions. So uh, moving on to the updates in the other uh, digital payments transformation roadmap components, we have the digital finance uh, infrastructure. Um, so here I'm happy to update uh, the audience that uh, the BSP in the industry has just uh, recent, well, uh, fairly relatively recently uh, migrated to the um, ISO 20,022 messaging standard. So what, what this means to, to the public is that number one, uh, because of the uh, more robust uh, messaging, it, it is able to handle uh, the 
the uh, the um, emerging financial transactions that are growing in uh, complexity, uh, while at the same time also uh, enabling uh, anti-money laundering um, uh, safeguards uh, to 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 uh, be uh, to accompany uh, such such growing uh, sophistication. Um, we have. Uh, uh, migrated our field pass um, to the new field pass plus, and, and this um, this already incorporates the ISO twenty thousand twenty two messaging. And another advantage of this is that because this is an international uh, standard, uh, it lends our settlement system uh, to uh, enabling uh, cross border. Uh, Payments, which, uh, by the way, we are also uh, pursuing. Um, the other uh, update here is the is the field sees uh, program of the government, the Philippine Identification System uh, program. So um, I'm I'm uh, happy to update you that uh, as of uh, our as of August or early August of um, this year, there are already 24 million. Uh, Filipinos who have uh, uh, completed the uh, biometric capture uh, portion or yeah, step of, of the process. So there, there are like um, uh, basically two steps. The first is uh, we or the, the, the public gives their demographic uh, data. And uh, then uh, step two is that they, they go to the registration centers to have their biometrics captured. So these are like the face, the iris, and, and the fingerprints. And this will be matched uh, with the demographic data. And this will undergo a process of the duplication uh, so that uh, the, the country can be uh, assured of um, the integrity of these uh, uh, IDs. So um, I'm also happy to, to uh, update you that uh, alongside this program, um, banks like the Land Bank of the Philippines uh, are co-locating with the step two registration sites such that uh, over 500, 5 million uh, formerly unbanked or mostly formerly unbanked Filipinos um, being able to open uh, e-money accounts with uh, with the participating banks, principally uh, Land Bank of the Philippines. So that's 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 contributing to the um, uh, number of financially included uh, uh, Filipinos. So um, the the uh, power of this uh, national digital ID is that um, it, it it makes it uh more convenient and easier to access services like it, it becomes easier to to open accounts because it, um whereas before some banks would ask for two government issued ids now presenting uh the field id or the yeah, philippine identification the, the this this id uh would suffice and and second because it can be digitally uh, authenticated, uh, that that process can even be digitalized, meaning you can uh, open account uh, by way of electronic uh, KYC, and both the the relying parties and the um, the customer are uh, would be confident that the, their proper identification will be uh, captured and uh, and uh, um, um, used uh, for them to access the, ser the services. And this would also uh, reduce the leakage and uh, inefficiency in uh, uh, government's delivery of social services because, uh, well, for one, um, government can better be assured that there's no um, duplication of uh, benefits and that um, the beneficiaries are um, um, indeed, uh, deserving of, of those uh, 
benefits. Um, uh, it would also make it easier to access uh, other uh, services because um, um, the, 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 uh, the cross-referencing of these databases would be enabled because there's a common uh, identity uh, database. So the, the, the third uh, is the digital governance and uh, standards. So um, again, you might have uh, learned about this already, but um, I'm just uh, um, uh, update the body that uh, we have the, the BSP has the open finance framework. Um, it issued last June in 2021 that um, for one, uh, allows the customer data upon consent of the customer uh, to be shared to other uh, service providers. So the, the power of that is it becomes easier um, for, let's say, uh, uh, let's say a, a, a person with, a, with an account um, to access credit because that customer can provide um, data on his past transactions to the, um, let's say, financial services provider where he is applying for, for uh, credit. So uh, whereas before, uh, financial services providers would rely on, on uh, assets, but now uh, to, to evaluate the capacity to pay, now they can look at previous uh, uh, financial transactions of a of an applicant uh, in order to, to evaluate uh, the, the person's or the business's uh, risk. Um, um, so that's, that's, uh, that's um, one of the um, progress we've made under digital governance and uh, standards. Um, so the next slide uh, is, I would just like to, uh, in uh, also in, um, keep you abreast of the uh, current enabling policy and regulatory environment that we have. So um, as, as you know, there is the National Payment Systems Act and uh, we uh, are, are working on the um, IRR or implementing rules and regula regulations starting off with um, um, having the various operators of payment system uh, register with a BSP, so um, we we can we can have a baseline inventory um, and also uh, classify them um, for the purpose of crafting um, um, appropriate and proportional uh, regulations to keep the safety and efficiency of the payment system, and we also have the payment system. Uh, oversight uh, framework that allows the, the BSP to designate payment systems that present um, um, risk to, to the stability of the uh, financial uh, system and also those payment systems that uh, have uh, impact on, on, um, on uh, public service, meaning they are used by many customers. Therefore, a denial of uh, service of these uh, payment system would really inconvenience uh, a lot of, of uh, the people. And uh, we're also aligning our uh, governance of uh, the, uh, our payment systems to, to conform to internationally set uh, standards. No? Uh, these are the principles for financial market infrastructure uh, as, as um, um, set by the Bank for International Settlements and, um, and uh, IOSCO. No? So it's like the, the um, Global Association of like, um, uh, SECs. Um, and then we have the guidelines on establishment of digital banks under circular bank, BSP circular number 1105. So as of now, as you know, there are already 
um, how many? So we have uh, OF Bank, we have uh, uh, Tonic, we have Uno, we have uh, Union Bank Digital, and there's Go Time. So the, there are already five. And the the uh, deadline for the application uh, has been set last August uh, 31. So um, those who have submitted complete up uh, requirements uh, uh, could be uh, granted the digital banking license. Um, the open finance uh, framework, I think as I mentioned this uh, earlier. So uh, moving on to the next uh, slide. Um, and and um, I'd, I'd like to, uh, yeah, so this is, this is the right slide. So uh, we have the uh, pending bills no, on the promotion of Digital Payments uh, Act and uh, BSP supports uh, uh, these, these uh, the objectives and then these, these bills uh, uh, themselves uh, as they are strategically aligned with our uh, objectives to build a robust and inclusive digital payments ecosystem in the uh, country. So um, the first, just putting them uh, side by side, um, the, we show in this slide some of key provisions of House Bill number 8992 and Senate Bill 1764. So first uh, is the provision which mandates the national government agencies, gov GOCCs and LGUs to prioritize the use of safe and efficient uh, digital payments. So in their financial transactions to scale up financial inclusion and optimize the benefits of technological innovation and promote sustainability. So by requiring these government institutions to use digital payments in their financial transactions, the government can contribute to the digital payments transformation in the country by setting an example or like walking the talk, as well as enabling all the individuals and businesses who deal with the government to experience firsthand the convenience and safety of uh, digital payments. And second is the provision uh, that requires government institutions to adopt and implement a comprehensive incentive uh, framework for the use of uh, uh, digital payments. So this provision likewise gives the LGUs the authority to impose uh, reduced fees or, or uh, in increased discounts or grant other incentives for merchants providing efficient digital payment uh, system. And uh, the third is uh, uh, requirement for the use of safe and efficient digital or electronic mode in the government's collection of payment of taxes, fees, uh, tolls, and other revenues, and the payment of goods, services, and other uh, disbursements. So uh, the use of digital platforms for government collections can help the government improve cost and operational efficiencies and plug various sources of revenue leaks. One example of such platform is the eGov Pay facility, which I described earlier, which utilizes the link based portal of the Land Bank of the Philippines. And this facility is now being used for e collections by about 413 government billers as of end July uh, 2021. Um, Meanwhile, digitalizing disbursements would allow a more efficient delivery of social aid and benefits, which are critical, especially in times of emergency and crisis. For instance, the second tranche of the SAP of the DSWD was primarily disbursed through nearly 10 million newly created transaction accounts, which significantly, significantly boosted financial inclusion in uh, 2020. And uh, the next Provision requires NGA, the government agencies, to adopt uh, uh, account-based uh, disbursements. So um, we, we hope to see a shift in the preference for uh, handing out uh, cash or checks for payments by government to 
to uh, paying all these obligations or all these benefits through the use of um, um, formal accounts uh, held by the, the beneficiaries um, or the, the businesses. And um, uh, now further to, to um, the, the provisions of the House bill and the Senate bill supportive of the roadmap, uh, another key provision here is the mandate for LGUs to enact ordinances requiring merchants within their localities to establish and or outsource arrangements that would enable them to receive payments from clients and make payments to creditors and suppliers as a prerequisite uh, for the approval or renewal of this, this uh, business permit. So this would drive the, the businesses operating in, in their respective jurisdictions to uh, give the option to their customers uh, of uh, paying uh, these businesses through the use of um, uh, digital payments for greater uh, convenience and also cost savings. And uh, same is um, encouraging these uh, LGUs to pair their suppliers uh, uh, through, through uh, PesoNet or uh, InstaPay. Huh? Um, so that, that uh, would be prerequisites for approval or renewal of their business uh, uh, permits. And the next provision is related to uh, the one I, I covered earlier on the assistance to small and micro merchants to facilitate their adoption of digital transactions capability. So this provision recognizes that these small economic actors would probably encounter more challenges in building capabilities so they can receive and make digital payments. So at this juncture, I'd like to reiterate that what I discussed earlier about the new payment streams that we are developing under the BSP's roadmap to specifically convert merchant payments, utility payments, and supplier payments into digital form as these use cases comprise the bulk of the total retail payments in, in the uh, country. So um, um, the, the importance of having a robust and resilient digital infrastructure has also been acknowledged in the proposed law as it provides that the DOST and the DICT implement measures to enhance nationwide internet uh, connectivity to, to, to um, support such, such a, a um, direction. So um, having shared the strides that we have made in our digital transformation journey, our current course charted under the BSP's Digital Payments Transformation Roadmap as well as the key provision of House Bill Number 8992 and Senate Bill Number 1764, we at the BSP believe that with the collaborative efforts of all key stakeholders, the country can build inclusive pathways as we move towards a cash life society and enable more Filipinos to have universal access to a responsive uh, digital payment services and reap the benefits of a growing digital economy. So thank you all, uh, and uh, um, again, once more, a pleasant afternoon to everyone. Back to you, John. Deputy G.G. Mert, uh, I'm overwhelmed by the amount of great information you just shared. Uh, I'm sure there'll be <clears throat> a lot of discussion. That I hope, can you stay on for a while? We yeah. have. We have several people from the banking sector and Rambat, our uh, <clears throat> financial uh, committee co-chair is going to introduce Henry, I believe is next, right Rambat? Uh, so, sir, uh, it's uh, attorney Ricky Salvador who will be introducing our next speaker. Oh, okay. Yes, uh, Randall, next sure. Um, yes, to provide the um, perspective of the banking sector, we have our next speaker, Mr. Henry Aguda, FICD. Is a senior executive vice president, chief technology and operations officer, and chief transformation officer of Union Bank of the Philippines, and also chairman of the board of UBX Philippines, the fintech virtual uh, venture studio of the bank. He is also currently a senior lecturer at the University of the Philippines, Diliman Technology Management Center, a global faculty mentor 
and Director of the Academy Advisory Board of the Asian Institute of Digital Transformation, a board member of Insular Healthcare, and a fellow member of the Institute of Corporate Directors. He is the author of the book, Data Privacy and Cybercrime Prevention in the Philippine Digital Age. Henry was recognized as one of the top 10 banking and financial technology leaders on digital reinvention in ASEAN 2021. Recently, he was awarded Private Privacy Advocate of 2021 by the National Privacy Commission, CTO of the Year Southeast Asia by the European Global Banking and Finance Awards 2021, and Chief Technology and Information Officer of the Year by the Asian Banker Financial Technology and Innovation Awards 2021. Mr. Aguda obtained his degrees in Bachelor of Science in Math Mathematics and Juris Doctor in Law, both from the University of the Philippines. Mr. Aguda, you have the floor. Hi, thank you, Attorney Ricky. So I, I think uh, you can hear me clear, clear, clear enough. Loud and clear. Uh, would you, okay, thank you very much. So, so with your permission, uh, I prepared the deck, but uh, you know, the presentation of Deputy Governor Tomona was so comprehensive and so spot on uh, that I'm happy that I, have, I, I, I could skip some of the slides so that we can also save up on time. So I guess uh, I'm speaking on behalf of the, the Bankers Association of the Philippines. Also, I'm uh, connected to Union Bank. So my presentation is less about Union Bank and more about what the industry is uh, moving to and as it relates to the current bill. So with your permission, I'll skip through some of the slides and move to slide number five, uh, which I think is the more, because uh, the initial slides are basically introduction to NRPS and most of them were covered by uh, Deputy Governor Tuan and uh, comprehensively and effectively. So can we move to slide? Uh, well, just to show you slide four, maybe. Uh, just to show you that uh, from uh, our bank's perspective, uh, can we move to slide four, please? Yeah, just to show you some empirical data, how it impacts uh, banks, particularly with Union Bank. So because of digital payment, our customers have actually, on the digital space, increased to 2.4 million as of the end of March of 2021, which is four times higher than what it was of December of 2019. So you, you see the hockey stick happening during the past year or so. 26% of these were customers who opened their account digitally through our app, 25 times compared to uh, December of 2019. And this is basically because of digital transactions. And you know, I don't have to elaborate on the situation we're in right now and why digital transactions are stimulated very well. Uh, just showing you some of the collaterals that Union Bank uh, has in terms of the products we've launched. We have an app for the consumers, an app for the SMEs, an app for corporates, etc. Next slide, please. This is where I want to get to immediately. The, I think the point of the conversation right now is the excitement uh, surrounding the proposed legislation by Senator Angara and uh, Congressman Kua on digital payments. And I was uh, fortunate enough to have been invited in that uh, session uh, where they consulted the industry and the re regulators on the, uh, on the bill. Uh, and I'm just going to focus on one key concept, which is the objective of the bill, which is for universal use of safe and efficient digital payments. I guess the key terms there would be, it has to be safe, not just efficient, but uh, it has to be secure. As uh, we all know, there's, a, uh, there's an inherent hazard to going online. But these are the things that uh, we've been doing together with the BSP. The BAP has been, next slide, please. The BSP has uh, actually this one, uh, the deputy governor went through this one. So I'll just go through a, a fast, uh, no, previous one. A fast discuss. Previous one, please. Previous one. I just. <laughs> Sorry. So something wrong with my slide. It has a mind of its own. Next slide, please. 
I just go through very quickly the circulars that have recently been uh, adopted by the banking industry for the past uh, three, four years. Uh, 808 is the Bible that all banks uh, abide by and circular 982, both of which have improved the uh, way that banks have secured their system. Circular 1019 has basically emphasized the need for uh, more responsive reporting and notification. This is very important for the protection of the consumers because uh, anything that happens out there that affects our consumers are immediately reported to uh, the BSP and for BSP to ensure that we act on them accordingly. Uh, and then BSP te uh, 1048, which is the guidelines uh, on financial and consumer protection. Just to also uh, inform the public that the BSP actually regular, regularly puts us to SAS, the banks, in terms of how we deal with our customers, and especially the ones that are new to the digital space. Then there are exciting frameworks. One is the BSP Memorandum on the Implementation of ISO 2022, which is the field pass. I, I, I won't elaborate on that one anymore because uh, it was uh, exhaustively explained by BSP earlier. And the BSP Circular 1122, or the adoption of the Open Finance Framework. Now, both will go hand in hand in making sure that everybody adapts to digital payment as the law envisions. And both will also set standards to, to keep it secure and provide SLAs on how fast we can provide service to the public. Next slide. Uh, just to note that in addition, the BS, BAP itself, the Banker Association, has collaborated with fellow banks to create a cybersecurity cooperation framework. See, we actually share threat intel uh, among each other. And we've seen for the past three years that our response to cyber threat have become much, much faster. So this is a committee that was uh, 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 implemented four years ago, very new, and now it's been very, very actively joined by several other banks. Next, we've also pushed the adoption of digital checks. You know, as a, an experience in Union Bank, when we launched the digital checks, the adoption went to 12 times how it was uh, in 2019 to 2020. So people are now moving to uh, scan checks and digital checks, and hopefully gone, will be, uh, gone are the days where you still need to do over-the-counter transaction to encash a check. As an industry, we're also working on putting together a common list of threats in the industry. Uh, this is uh, what we're trying to do, a blacklist of uh, threat actors, hackers, and fraudsters. Over and above the mandated sanctions list and negative list that the regulators uh, have. Next is we, as an industry, we support the national ID system. We feel that uh, uh, it shall be a valid proof of identity that shall be a means of simplifying public and private transactions, enrollment in schools, and opening of banks. This is similar to the use case of contract tracing we are doing now with the LGU or, or QR code. So this is something that uh, uh, we uh, really support. And as soon as more people are onboarded on the field sys, the easier will our KYC requirements be as, a, as an industry. We also support the bill that basically uh, will mandate the registration for the KYC of SIM cards. Just as uh, information to the public, uh, we've, our cybersecurity organization tracked down all the fraud cases and phishing cases and they're 100% perpetrated by prepaid phones. So prepaid phones are the tool of choice of cyber hackers and fishers. And if we have a robust system of registering and doing the KYC on this phone, we feel that that will drastically move the needle in reducing the number of phishing and cyber fraud. We also would want to push for the concept of a cyber insurance. Uh, a lot of incidents happen in the country because of fraud. Each and every financial institution does their part in educating their clients, but there is no assurance that they can get their money back. One of the things that we're trying to conceptualize is maybe 
aside from providing maybe the proper cybersecurity tools and cybersecurity protection to the customers who do their banking transaction at home, maybe a cyber insurance is something that uh, we can look at. Uh, aside from that, uh, coming closer to Union Bank. Next slide, please. Uh, in Union Bank, we're doing our part, and, and this is reflected in the other banks as well. But uh, to be more specific on what we're doing, we've now been working closely with uh, LGUs and government institutions. In fact, we have uh, digital payments cooperation with the Supreme Court. So that the bill that's being proposed is very, very timely because now once the bill is out, it will now provide a more standard and seamless framework for banks to now extend services to government instrumentalities. Just recently, UBP signed a contract to provide e-payment solutions to the Supreme Court. Uh, and this is now the one being used by uh, bar takers to register for the bar uh, for this year. We also are doing our part as a bank to follow cybersecurity practices. Apart from our initiatives of impayment, we also focus on efforts in protecting our customers from bad actors. So we've taken uh, ads on TV, radio, and that's one of the ads that's been playing. Uh, that one of our more famous celebrities talking about uh, how to prevent uh, phishing attacks and news. Uh, on top of the infrastructure that we built, to protect the public. Next is uh, we've incubated a lot of solutions that we want to share to the public in order for them to not only do digital payments, but also do digital commerce as a whole. We have uh, UBX, which is Union Bank's fintech company and innovation subsidiary. We have services created to help other organizations transform as well as uh, we become digital in in our commerce, we expect that a lot of companies will need, will need technical help to navigate through that uh, digital journey. Uh, this includes digital payment capabilities that enable different forms of integration. Most of it, almost all of it, are via API. Uh, you notice that the UBP payment process, next slide please, for an onboarding is uh, simply captured in this uh, scenario. Without digital payment, this experience would not uh, materialize. So with Union Bank and with the uh, similar features of the other banks also, all you need to do right now to avail of banking services, you download an app, you take a picture of yourself, you take a picture of your uh, nationally, national government IDs, if it's a field system, much better. Uh, and within three to five minutes, you already have a working bank account. To, in order for you to put money into that account, you don't have to go to any branch counter. You just have to take a picture of an existing check that you write to yourself. And that check gets uh, credited immediately to your account the next day, depending on the cutoff that uh, uh, you hit. And once it's funded, you now can do digital payment from the safety and comfort of your homes, which is very critical nowadays during the situation we're in. Uh, that whole ecosystem is already existing with the uh, two new bills, I guess, that will now be uh, the new normal for all government transactions. I would like to end uh, uh, my portion with stating that the fact that UBP has always aligned its services towards the obje objective of the bill. We have done our part, but we are still thinking of new ways to further help our clients. And together with the BAP, we're in step for having a better digital payment infrastructure for the country. That's my presentation. Thank you very much. Well, that's fantastic, Henry. Thanks so much for that. I learned a great deal. I'm sure all of the audience has as well. Uh, we have a few questions coming in. I encourage people to continue to put those in, but we still have two more speakers. Uh, Ricky, are you introducing? Uh, uh, sir, 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 the, the next, um, our next speaker is Mr. Edwin Reyes, and it's Mr. Rombitko who will oh, be. Of giving course, the Edwin, on. your colleagues. Thank you, John. So, I I have the pleasure now of introducing Edwin Reyes, who is the 
executive vice president and the transaction banking group head of BDO Unibank Incorporated. So as a group head of transaction banking, Edwin offers and his group offers cash management services to corporates, financial institutions, middle market and SME clients, as well as remittance, payments and online banking to businesses and individuals. Edwin has more than 30 years of experience in the banking industry, and he joined BDO in June 2015. Prior to that, Edwin was managing director and global head of depository receipts at uh, Deutsche Bank in New York. He also worked at IBJ Whitehall Financial Services, UBS, PW, P Pricewaterhouse, and Bankers Trust also in New York. Mr. Reyes also serves on the board of BDO's Rural Bank and Microfinancing subsidiary, BDO Network Bank. Edwin holds an MBA from Columbia University and has an undergraduate degree in industrial engineering and operations research from University of the Philippines. Edwin, you have the screen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rambit. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, firstly, I'd like to thank the American Chamber of Commerce, Mr. John Forbes, thank you uh, for inviting us to present uh, in this afternoon's uh, forum. I'm humbled and honored to uh, present on behalf of BDO. And thanks as well to our esteemed guests uh, and the other attendees. Uh, we really appreciate the opportunity to uh, share our thoughts. So what I'd like to do today is give you a general brief update on what BDO has been up to in terms of uh, digitalization and to share with you some of the key initiatives that the bank has been working on. The first slide already shown on the screen, thanks, is that Randall? <laughs> uh, can everybody see the, the slide? Okay. Yes. Yeah, okay, great. Yeah, this is my first slide. As a backdrop, I'll begin with this slide that shows BDO's market reach to date. As you can see, we are in four continents uh, and 16 international locations. But specifically in the Philippines, we currently have 1,500 branches. 75% of these are in Metro Manila and Luzon, and the rest in Visayas and Mindanao. Complementing these branches are more than 4,000 ATMs across the country. We believe in being where our clients are, at least in this case, physically, including Filipinos abroad or OFWs. From that standpoint, we have very wide and very exhaustive coverage in key areas. Next slide, please. Now, with that backdrop, uh, let me give you now an overview of our dig digital journey, which, which really started about four years ago. First is our next generation, or call it next gen IT platforms. These include hardware architecture and software framework that makes our applications run. In general, these are operating systems, includes customer identity access, client relationship management, cybersecurity, open banking API, the latter two, which uh, Dr. William Yu in an earlier presentation was discussing. Uh, we have re-architected and redesigned our platforms. Then we go to the applications or software that support specific businesses. These include front-end systems of engagement, that will now be implemented under the new platforms. And uh, the businesses impacted uh, ran the whole gamut from cash management, remittances, consumer banking, wealth management, insurance. And thirdly, uh, we will be converting our legacy systems to the new platforms. And we have many of these, as you know, we've, part of the big growth of the bank was due to acquisitions. And lastly, and most importantly are the people. So upskilling, is ongoing for key resources. Now I'd like to add that the pandemic that the entire world has been dealing with since March of 2020 has changed the way we do business in many ways. And like many other service providers, many of our clients who previously were not so keen on using our digital and electronic products became converts. In fact, during the early days back in April, May of 2020, we have seen a huge uptick in the number of transactions using our digital channels compared to over-the-counter transactions, which majority of our clients have traditionally 
been doing. And this is consistent with the data presented earlier, again, by Dr. William Liu, by Anna of GCash as well, and Deputy Governor Tangonan of the BSP. While we have embarked on the digital journey as far back as four years ago, we can all agree that the pandemic has heightened uh, the need to accelerate the pace of transformation for two reasons. Erstwhile traditional clients uh, are now getting more comfortable using electronic channels. And we've seen that. And banks being keen to provide their customers with alternative, and I would say safer, ways to do banking without the usual in-person, face-to-face transactions. thus helping the risk of, let's say, COVID-19 infection, for example. Next slide, please. What I'd like to do is just share with you some examples of our initiatives aimed at enhancing customer experience. And to date, uh, we started by you know, the basic uh, examining our business processes and re-engineering them to streamline operations, simplify forms, and improve efficiency overall. Uh, the objective is to fully digitize our processes, which also reduces costs over time. I have some examples to share with you today briefly uh, online CASA opening, cardless ATMs, and paperless in branch transactions. Next slide, please. So, starting with the online account opening, as an alternative to the traditional way of op opening a bank account, where you go to the physical branch, fill out an application form, present your ID and personal information. Now we can do this doing away with the physical forms and no need to visit a branch. Uh, as it says here, you can do it opening an account from anywhere. Uh, and other banks are actually doing this as well. For us, it uh, requires a minimum 2,000 initial deposit for 40 US dollars. The Know Your Customer evaluation is done via video call uh, by trained personnel. Uh, as mentioned by also De Deputy Governor Tangonan, this can be digitally facilitated. And we have a face nationwide approach for this rollout. The benefits are clear and many. Fully digitized process, improved efficiency, and faster turnaround time. And most importantly, enhanced customer experience. Next slide. Next are our cardless ATMs. Again, a face rollout nationwide. So no need to bring your ATM card. For ID, there are multiple. For identification, there are multiple cardless options, facial recognition, fingerprint scanning, use of the QR code. The key here is to pre-process your intended transaction using your mobile banking application. So you can do that from the comforts of your home. A QR is generated. So when you go to the ATM, the turnaround will be quick. Next slide, please. And similarly, for a fully digital in-branch experience, pre-processing is done through our mobile banking app. QR is generated, and when you visit the branch, there will be no need to fill out deposit slips and other forms, and the turnaround time will be faster. Again, this will be a face rollout in Metro Manila for us. Next slide. And then you may finally have heard about this, the BDO Pay, our new mobile wallet app. This complements our mobile and personal digital banking applications and will additionally include a wallet or stored value facility good for e-commerce. To fund your wallet, you can link to our video account, your video account, debit and credit cards, which would be good funding sources. With video pay, you can send money, pay bills, request money, and other payment transactions straight from your account. Next slide, please. And this is really my last slide, right? Uh, for us, digital strategies more than just products. The four examples I just shared with you are visible to us, to us and to our clients. The new product capabilities that we have been endeavoring for many months now have been gradually rolled out across the network and that more products are expected to be added to the platform in the coming months. But we also have a lot of initiatives, the bottom part of the chart, that aim to enhance processing on the back end. It enables everything else. Uh, and examples are 
robotics process automation or RPA, essentially using software programs to automate repetitive tasks. We are applying this to our back office processes initially. Then we have data analytics. Data, as we know, is the new currency. And we use this to better understand our customers and address their needs. Cloud computing and all the benefits that come with it in terms of scalability, security, contingency planning, specialized expertise from uh, the vendors that we're using. And then cybersecurity. Uh, we all heard from Dr. William Yu as well earlier regarding the importance of safety for banks and financial institutions. We have engaged ex experts in this field and deployed the appropriate tools to further protect the bank. And we already talked about our next gen IT platform, which is about re-architing uh, our, our back end. So in conclusion, you know, I just like to make a few points. In the end, it's all about client centricity for us. We're doing this to enhance the suite of services that our customers want and provide solutions that directly address their pain points when doing banking. It is incumbent upon us, incumbents, to upgrade our digital capabilities to cater to evolving customer expectations. I would also like to point out that there is still a huge segment of our client base who prefer to go to the branch, the physical branch, engage with their branch relationship managers the traditional way. We in BDO believe that the omni-channel approach, so we offer both physical and digital channels to all our customers and give them the option on how to access their accounts and perform their financial transactions. And finally, we in BDO are, BDO are very much aware of the fact that what got us to where we are now will not be the same things that will get us to where we want to be. Uh, the markets have changed. We'll, we will continue to change and uh, we will strive to do that for the best of our customers. Customers primarily, but also keeping in mind our employees, investors, working with the regulators, and of course, for the communities that we serve. Thank you. Thank you, Edwin. That was, uh, <clears throat> that was probably the simplest of the charts we saw, but you filled it with information. I was particularly interested in your back office. We are starting to get some questions and we're also running out of time. So I wanna uh, ask, uh, Ricky, are you introducing Isfri Sibalingan? Yes, I am. Can you do that? And then sure. we'll questions after we get a regional perspective. Thank you, John. So to give us the regional and global perspective, we have our last speaker, uh, Isvari Sivalingam. Isvari is Southeast Asia lead at the Better Than Cash Alliance, the United Nations-based partnership of governments, companies, and international organizations that accelerates the transition from cash to digital payments to reduce poverty and drive inclusive growth. She has more than 12 years of experience spanning both the public and private sectors and has specialized in poverty and vulnerability alleviation through economic development and financial inclusion. Her expertise areas include strategy and research in digital financial services and has supported the design of programs at AFD, the ADB, the MetLife Foundation, and the UN. She was previously Anglophone Africa Banking and Financial Sector Lead at Microsave Consulting, advising both the, the private sector and the international development partners and leading research projects on digital financial services across Asia and Africa. Isvari was also a founding member of the UN Capital Development Fund's SHIFT program, a regional program aimed at advancing women's economic empowerment. A key output was regional commitment to financial inclusion and the establishment of a dedicated committee by the ASEAN finance ministers. Isvari was a Lee Kuan Yew scholar at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, earning a dual degree master's in public policy with sciences, Popari. Isvari, you have the floor. Thank you for that very kind introduction. Uh, warm greetings to distinguished panelists, Honorable Congressman Juni, Senator Sunny, DG Mert Tangonan, 
colleagues from the private sector and all attendees today. Let me start by thanking AmCham Philippines and the USAID Respond Initiative for the very kind invitation to participate in this very important discussion on the proposed promotion of digital payments bill that is um, pending Senate deliberations. Today, I'll be presenting a very quick overview of the various types of reforms and incentives that have been employed globally by countries seeking to encourage and increase electronic payments acceptance and use. Um, I will also focus on some key initiatives where the Alliance has been supporting our members in order to catalyze and accelerate merchant digitization specifically, um, which is, as you know, one of the focus areas of this bill, in addition to the mandate uh, for all government units, including LGUs to digitize payments. We can move on to the next slide. For those of us who are unfamiliar with the Alliance, we are actually a UN-based uh, partnership of governments, companies, and international organizations. And through our members, we aim to catalyze the global movement from cash to digital to achieve the sustainable development goals, to reduce poverty, and to drive inclusive growth. Next slide. As I said, the Alliance has 77 members, including national governments from Africa, Asia Pacific, Latin America, as well as the prominent companies that you see on the screen, um, as, and, our, um, and international organizations, many of them are sister UN agencies who have all committed to digitizing payments. We are proud to also note that the government of the Philippines is one of the founding members uh, of the Alliance globally. It is important to note here that billions of dollars in cash payments are being made daily in emerging and developing countries. These include salaries, social transfers from governments, humanitarian relief, payments to suppliers, as well as farmers. And shifting these payments from cash to digital has the potential to improve the lives of people um, of low income, particularly for women. It also means that governments, companies, international organizations can make and receive payments in a cheaper, safer, and more transparent way, and ultimately help to build economies that are inclusive. Our position is not to abolish physical cash, but rather we aim to enable choice for all users on how to make and receive payments. We want all digital payment options to be responsible and effectively for digital payments to scale, they need to be better than cash. Next slide. Yes, our work with government members globally, including here in the Philippines has led to the prioritization of the merchant digitization, or as we say, the person to business payment use case, given the importance of merchants as critical nodes of payment acceptance, uh, of the payment acceptance ecosystem, and their broader role also in driving overall digitization of payments in emerging markets. In the Philippines, for example, as um, DG Burnt mentioned earlier, three in every four payments are merchant payments. And, and this drives a huge potential uh, to drive digitization in the overall economy. Globally, the Alliance also contributes to a global working group. Uh, this is called the Fiji Electronic Payment Acceptance Working Group, which is part of an initiative led by the World Bank Group and supported by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. What a comprehensive study of policies and incentives implemented across the world uh, to drive electronic payment accept, uh, acceptance has revealed that there are actually a variety of different incentives that can be used to, to incentivize a broader electronic payments acceptance. As you can see on the slide here, mandates are part of a type of reform or incentive uh, that is intended to actually change the behavior of users um, and, and customer segments. And, and with reference to the bill that we're discussing, you know, the focus is really on um, the local government units as well as uh, the merchant segment. Um, from the study, it was clear that out of the 17 countries assessed, you know, four of them had basically implemented some form of EPA mandate, um, and the four countries are listed here. I just also want to quickly cover some of the recommendations, um, which I think are useful in this discussion of, of uh, the, the bill. Um, 
you know, countries seem to implement a set of incentives and there's no real conclusion on the single best incentive. Um, what we have found also is that public sector incentives mainly focus on fiscal incentives, merchant subsidies and regulations dis discouraging cash use and private sector incentives are mainly focused on product innovation and, you know, providing also value added services in addition to the financial service itself um, to the customer segment. And the appropriate types of incentives for each market actually needs to be contextualized to the level of development in each market. Um, so, you know, I think in, with reference to the bill, um, we're generally supportive of the bill uh, because it will support um, the acceleration of digital payments and it will encourage specific underserved segments uh, or harder to reach uh, customer segments to also adopt um, uh, digital payments. Um, but I'm, I was also very happy to, to hear Senator uh, Ang Angora's mention that, um, you know, it also, it also acknowledges the challenges that these specific segments face in adopting digital payments and the adequate time um, for implementation of this reform, as well as the required um, support mechanisms, uh, both from the government as well as the supply side, uh, needs to be incorporated, um, um, you know, for the successful implementation of this bill. I started off this presentation saying that, you know, one of our primary goals for digital payments is to be responsible. And in the next slide, I'd like to say a little bit about what we mean by um, responsibility in digital payments and um, the eight original guidelines and the ninth new guideline that we'll be launching um, at the end of this month. We can move on to the next slide, please. So the original Better Than Cash Alliance Responsible Digital Payments identified eight good practices for engaging with clients who are sending or receiving digital payments and who are typically financially excluded or underserved. Um, the refreshed version that I mentioned will be rebranded as the UN Principles for Responsible Digital Payments. It comes with uh, endorsement from senior UN leaders um, across a variety of UN agencies. Um, and it will also reflect you know, a more intentional focus on women. Um, we know in the Philippines is one of the few markets in the world globally that, that where women traditionally outperform men even in the adoption of uh, uh, digital payments. This is not the case globally. Um, so, so we do have an intentional focus uh, on women. And we do see these principles as being fundamental to ensuring that the process of payment digitization is inclusive and sustainable. On the point of inclusivity, um, you know, the priorities that have been mentioned uh, by the many speakers before me around interoperability, ensuring safety of digital funds, ensuring privacy and data protections, um, which are also, I believe, acknowledged in this bill are extremely critical and a step in the right direction. Um, specifically also to create long-term value proposition for, for merchant digitization. We'll move on to the next slide where I would like to speak about a number of initiatives where we are supporting our government members uh, on digitization of merchants and electronics payments acceptance. I'll go through the initiatives in Mexico and India in greater detail, uh, but before I do that, I also do want to mention that under the leadership of the BSP and the DTI, um, a public-private working group focused on merchant digitization um, uh, has been established. It also includes the participation of payment service providers in the Philippines, represented by the PPMI, firms from the e-commerce and FMCG sectors, as well as the retail merchant and industry associations uh, who are members of this working group. Um, and we do have focused research on the micro and small merchant, um, sec uh, particularly in the FMCG sector that is forthcoming um, for the Philippines. So we, we um, look forward to sharing those uh, with you at some time next year as well. Moving on to the next slide, uh, where I will talk about what we have done in Mexico. Um, there are two specific initiatives. The first one is also a public-private uh, sector working group, um, which you know, was founded by some action research that we did in Mexico. And 
basically the objective of this working group is to come up with a roadmap for stakeholder um, priorities that are identified as accelerators for uh, EPA acceptance. Um, and each of these proposals specifically highlight the pain points, um, you know, and seek to also address these specific pain points. And for small merchants particularly, you know, there are still pain points around costs, um, you know, understanding of the platforms, trust in the platforms. Um, and these are very similar issues that we're also discussing in the Philippines. The second is a um, tax uh, review that we are working with the Mexican Tax Authority on. It's basically to evaluate, uh, you know, alternatives um, on tax compliance simplification. Uh, you know, this issue of taxation and formalization is quite intrinsically linked to the issue of digitalization as well. Um, because, you know, uh, you know for, for merchants to be onboarded, they need to have the required KYC as, as discussed below, bef before. And here we are trying to also um, basically look at ways to reduce the cost of tax compliance, particularly for the micro and small um, uh, merchants. And, and, you know, the impact is, uh, the impact of such reforms uh, will be on the 4.5 million uh, MSMEs that are in Mexico. So just to, just to mention again that, you know, um, coming back to my earlier point of there's a variety of reforms, um, and I think the bill acknowledges that, you know, this is one way and there are other support mechanisms, um, the mandates that are being recommended for the LGUs and the merchant segments are one way and there are other um, supporting mechanisms that can also be in place. Um, and, and this is how it's being done in, in other markets. And we are also starting to discuss that uh, together with, with BSP and uh, DTI in the Philippines. Coming now to my last slide um, on India, um, also just very quickly to talk about how we have worked, worked there. Um, you know, our focus in India has been uh, with the government as well, uh, but also with the private sector. First one with the government focus on, focuses on the Northeast region, which is one of the lesser developed parts of uh, the India, which, which you know is, is a subcontinent. And the goal there is really uh, to unlock the retail opportunity of $15 billion that has been identified, um, which really requires a successful digitization of approximately 50 million merchants in this region, um, a good percentage of whom are women. Uh, so in line with the government of India's uh, Act East policy, we actually identified and uh, created commitment to seven priority action areas for responsible merchant digitization. Um, and this is also being supported by you know, government-wide commitments and actions, including uh, incentive structures like the RBI, the Reserve Bank of India, which is the Central Bank of India's $500 million merchant infrastructure fund. Um, which prioritizes the Northeast region. Separately with uh, Hindustan Unilever, which is the Indian arm of uh, the global FMCG firm Unilever, um, we have partnered to digitize the rural sales force of approximately 100,000 women who are called Shakti Ammas in India, um, which contributes to approximately 7% 7, 7 of Hindustan Unilever's um, annual revenues. And um, here we are basically, you know, um, we have supported the integration of payments digitization to the inventory management system and application that Hindustan Unilever has, um, has developed. And, you know, going forward, we are also working with Hindustan Unilever to incorporate digital payments performance indicators um, um, with merchants in urban and, and rural uh, India across all of HUL's uh, programs. So that, that really concludes um, my presentation today. Um, and I just, wanna, I just want to uh, finish by once again saying that, you know, we are generally in support of this bill. It is an important legislation to, um, you know, raise, to elevate the importance of, um, uh, digital payments in, in transforming the Philippines into a truly and truly inclusive 
uh, digital economy. Um, and we just hope that, you know, the provisions around the challenges that, um, you know, these customer segments faced are also recognized and adequate support mechanisms are um, in place uh, in order to enable successful implementation of this bill. With that, thank you very much. Uh, it's so exciting. <clears throat> what a new world that we live in. Um, we're, a few people, I say, Rambut, thank you. Rambut, I can't thank you. I see you've gone on to another call and Dr. Lamberte. I have about six questions and met, most of them are for the BSP. So is <clears throat> Deputy Governor Mert still with us? Mert? Yeah, yes, John, I'm still around. Okay, I, I'm going to take a question coming from uh, <clears throat> from Leyte, uh, from a gentleman that uh, uh, Ed and I met when we went down after Haiyan, Oliver Tam. Uh, Oliver asks, can the BSP and the banks push for wider digital cryptographic signature adoption, especially with the widespread availability of smartphones that support biometric fingerprints, irises, retinas, authentication integration with PKI? The current DICTP and PKI system is still a private hierarchy chain of trust and does not scale into millions of users. Hoping that this can also be pushed as a key backend infrastructure to further strengthen the confidence, authentication, and non repudiation of digital banking transactions and digital contracts. From Oliver Cam in Takloba. Uh, yes, John. So John, right now that it, the initiative on digital signature is being spearheaded by the DICP. Um, so they are the uh, like the uh, certificate authority for the whole Philippines and uh, they have the authority to accredit um, uh, other certifying uh, uh, bodies to, to uh, cater to uh, providing or uh, supporting digital signatures of other uh, segments, uh, not only uh, for government. But having said that, um, for for the you see the use of digital uh, signature is an infrastructure that will be used all throughout, uh, not only for financial transactions, but I mean it's got to have legal certainty. And uh, in other words, uh, it's it's really a a whole of uh, government. Uh, uh, work so um, uh, personally, I'll be happy to uh, for BSP to support uh, such uh, initiative. But uh, to to lead it may need a a more uh, comprehensive um, a whole of government approach. Uh, that's my thoughts on that, John. Thank you. Can you give an approximate timeline when you think it might be more widely implemented? Uh, right now, John, I have to uh, rely on the uh, timeline set by DICT for the for the digital signature infrastructure. So, as to the specific uh, timeline, John, I have yet to uh, look at my notes on, on when when that, that uh, would be. Uh, well, with all the rapid changes, I'm sure it'll be <clears throat> sooner than later. Um, yeah, hopefully, especially with the with the uh, digital national ID. Uh, that's fantastic. Uh, a question from uh, Donato Pua. What is, what is the charges plan for QR pay? Who bears the fee? Oh, it's going to be aligned by, um, uh, it's going to be aligned with uh, the, the um, you know, market standards for merchant payments, which is, uh, uh, it is the, the merchant that, that pays the, the, or bears the service, service fee and the, the, the customer uh, doesn't have to pay anything above uh, the the cost or the price of the merchandise that it's buying. So if if the if the merchant total merchandise uh, is valued at let's let's just say five hundred pesos, the all the customer needs to pay five hundred pesos. So no, it, it, the customer doesn't bear the the fee for the service. Having said that, John, uh, it doesn't preclude the the financial uh, service provider um, servicing the merchant. To, um, to offer it to the merchant uh, at no cost at all. Um, meaning, uh, you know, uh, the, the bank could, uh, or the financial services provider could uh, very well uh, bear the fees for some 
uh, reasons that are aligned with their strategic uh, objectives. So in that in that case, uh, especially for micro and small merchants, uh, there'd be a less uh, barrier for them to adopt uh, merchant digital merchant payments. Thank you, John. Thank you, DG Mert. Um, an anonymous attendee uh, <clears throat> has made a comment on the interagency stakeholder collaboration. Uh, he or she noticed that the BIR is not included. Is digital supporting documents acceptability with BIR also part of the pending bills and digital payment roadmap? Obviously, somebody who's had to prepare a lot of paper for audits has asked this question. Uh, is that addressed to me, uh, John? Uh, no, not particularly. No, I, I don't. But they're just commenting why the BIR is not in the interagency stakeholder collaboration. Uh, but just just to uh, contribute uh, to that, uh, John, uh, I believe BIR is part of the Public Financial Committee uh, that is um, uh, uh, spearheaded by the Department of Finance. And this committee, um, uh, among the initiatives of this committee, is uh, the the um, uh, digital payment, the use of digital payments for government uh, disbursements and collections. No? Um, so BIR is part of that, and uh, in as far as the question is uh, concerned on the, the digitalizing, uh, I, I reckon this is concerning the uh, requirement the requirements for hard copies of uh, com commercial documents like uh, invoices and uh, official receipts. I believe um, BIR, by virtue of the train law, um, is is uh, will be piloting. Uh, an electronic sales reporting system or something like an e-invoicing uh, um, uh, framework uh, that uh, will um, recognize the use of uh, data, di uh, digital data uh, as uh, compliance to audit requirements in lieu of hard copy ORs and uh, invoices. There is, the, I think that's for larger companies and the train, train one. Uh, right now, John, yes, that's that's for large tax uh, payers. But but John, if it's successful there, uh, we, we I mean I'm, I'm sure that would cascade. There, there's also an ease of paying taxes law, which I believe passed in the House yesterday, that actually proposes to do away with the OR. <clears throat> so. You know, we get excited by all these changes because we think of the environment. We think that we're the fourth worst traffic congestion in major cities in the world. And, um, and it's just so much easier for our lives to do this the digital way. Um, there's only one last question, DG, <clears throat> Deputy DG Mert. Uh, so I guess this is thrown your, your way and then I have one for the banks. Um, is there an interagency committee or council in the public sector which regularly discusses relevant digital initiatives? Uh, for example, there's an industry development council supposed to promote manufacturing and a national innovation council. How do the various government agencies coordinate their efforts? Maybe this is a better question for DICT, but they're not with us today. Well, uh, my, 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 a uh, short answer to that, John, is uh, there's none to my knowledge uh, of such a body that uh, coordinates uh, everything, uh, digital transactions or, or uh, including payments in government. But uh, there are um, uh, committees that are, you know, have, have their uh, or, or uh, interagency coordinating um, coord um, bodies that are uh pursuing their their own um mandates that touch upon uh, digitalization for example we have the financial inclusion steering committee that's led by uh, the bsp so that uh, this committee includes like uh, you know that ed the swd uh dole and several other uh, government agencies and one one fruit of that uh, john is that the the SAP, the, the SAP 2, uh, the distribution of that was made possible through uh, digital payments, through uh, formal accounts by uh, uh, beneficiaries. So that, that was uh, uh, through the um, 
uh, initiative of the Financial Inclusion Steering Committee. And then I, I've mentioned, uh, second is I've mentioned the Public Financial Committee from uh, uh, DOF, of which BSP, BIR, DBM, COA, um, and several other agencies are part of. And uh, like what is very mentioned earlier, there, there's an e-commerce uh, coordinating uh, body also that's... Uh, that includes uh, BTI along with its uh, stakeholders and uh, um, I, I believe even the BSP. Thank you, Deputy Governor Mert. Um, you may have to go. I'm going to not ask you any more questions. Uh, please stay on if you'd like, but there's just a few more questions um, uh, for the banking representatives. And I'd also like to announce for the benefit of everyone that uh, we did learn that the, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the Senate will hold next week a TWG on this legislation. So that I, uh, if, if uh, Juni, uh, Rep. Juni's office is still listening, uh, uh, Dodi, uh, you pass that on please to Rep. Juni, that uh, that I think fits into the time frame that he was suggesting with only 30 plus session days. Uh, if the TWG starts, at work, starts its work and works in October, uh, then it's quite possible that by November, they'll have a committee report to sponsor in plenary. So we can be optimistic about the future of this in the current 18th Congress. Um, uh, Raisa Robles of the South China Morning Post is asking, in paying through GCash. Anna, are you still there? I wonder if Anna Bautista is still with us. Uh, well, this may be generic for, uh, <clears throat> for digital payments and paying how to claim deductions for tax purposes. That's a good BIR question. Do any of our bankers know when you at <clears throat> a union bank or BDO? You take a screenshot. Raisa, I'm going to disappoint you. Well, okay. Yeah, Jan. So I don't know if this is exactly what, you, uh, what the uh, question is about, but uh, we're working with BIR right now because uh, the issue is they cannot collect taxes from uh, online uh, providers that are overseas. And uh, I think there's a platform that they will now create where uh, a digital service provider platform where they, the online uh, providers would have to register uh, with the BIR and as soon as they've been registered, uh, the receipting will be automatic. Now, that's, uh, that's one way of uh, addressing that issue, especially if the online sellers are outside of the country. And most of the online sellers right now are based outside of the country. So it's coming, uh, hopefully before end of the year. But, uh, you know, I uh, would have loved it if BIR is represented this, this session. They'd be able to uh, explain it in, in more details. Okay, another question <clears throat> having to do with PesoNet. Is there a move to further reduce PesoNet and insta-pay fees? In other countries, interbank transfer fees are non-existent. Do the banks, anybody from the banks want to talk about the fees they charge? I'd love to hear Henry answer that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we started off, uh, thank you, DG. Well, we started off InstaPay and PesoNet uh, free, if you remember, way back, uh, as far back as last year, I believe. And uh, recently, uh, I don't remember the, the exact fees because I might make a mistake, but I know we have the lowest ones. So just for people's... Uh, appreciation also while we want to give it for free as we experience the increase in the load of servicing you could understand the, the cost that uh, uh, the banks would have to bear uh, just to give maybe the banking well our customers uh, specifically we're trying to do our very best to bring it down further uh, may not be, be free like uh, how we started the uh, years back, but uh, we're definitely going to make it as attract attractive as possible. 
uh, unless it's mandated by the BSP to be free. So I leave it up to the BSP. <laughs> Uh, there is one final anonymous question uh, regarding the proposed Digital Payments Act. BSP regulations require payment providers to collect KYB, know your business documents from merchants when they open accounts. And for some barangay level merchants, sorry, sorry stores, for example, this can still be challenging. To address this, a risk-based approach the KYB requirements may be adopted, or the law would take effect first on bigger businesses to give smaller merchants time to prepare. Well, this seems to be more of a comment than a question, and I suppose it's the type of thing that could be discussed in the TWG, but does any, anybody want to comment on, on how the Sorry Sorry store deals with this kind of a challenge? Well, John, uh, um, actually, my team is uh, uh, looking into that right now, uh, reviewing uh, uh, existing laws and regulations governing uh, that, because it's not only BSP regulations involved, but there are also AML um, factors uh, to be considered uh, here. But nonetheless, uh, uh, yes, that, I mean, we, if, if we are to, to pursue the 50% digital payments uh, share of total retail payments transaction volume. Then we have, we have to reach uh, even the, the micro, uh, small, and, and even including the informal ones, uh, John, to start formalizing uh, them. So um, given that, it, it has to be uh, at least the, the, the onboarding or the enablement really has to be very simple and, and convenient, otherwise uh, that segment uh, of our population would simply uh, you know, discard it if, if, if it's gonna be uh, complicated and with uh, many um, requirements that may you know, not actually be uh, applicable to the risks they are presenting. All right, well, there is a, <laughs> one last question just came in, Jalene Guerrera, Ask regarding PesoNet, is there a plan to increase the cutoff times or even have this real time? There's only one cutoff per day and payment is not real time yet, unlike Gcash and or other platforms. I guess that's another one for you. Well, uh, John, uh, in my presentation, I made mention of a multiple uh, PesoNet batch uh, settlement. So that, that uh, we're, we're, we're um, uh, in the final stages of it, uh, John, working together with the uh, industry and the Pesonet ACH, Automated Clearing House, uh, which I think Henry might be a, a member of. Um, um, uh, we Right now, we, we settle at 4 o'clock. Uh, so we will have uh, another uh, settlement in the morning so that uh, you know, morning transactions can, can get settled uh, uh, after you get back from lunch, uh, John, you just see the credit in your account. Um, and for afternoon transactions to be settled by end of day. So um, that, as I've mentioned, uh, will, will uh, uh, you know, uh, enable suppliers and, and uh, the public in general to, to make use of their funds earlier. Can I follow up? Does that apply to weekends? I know the banks don't set, if you send something on Friday, it doesn't get to the destination until Monday. For Pesonet, yes, because that's a that's a, a batch uh, uh, electronic credit uh, transfers um, that's uh, suitable for large uh, amounts. Um, so right now we that that's done uh, during uh, banking days only when when settlement fill pass is uh, fill pass plus is uh, operating or is open, um, but. Um, uh, there are some uh, suggestions from even from the industry, John, to look at uh, uh, making that real time. So consultations are are uh, uh, ongoing, uh, John, because um, you know there are uh, factors to be considered in in providing that service. Nonetheless, John, there's like InstaPay that operates even on weekends, holidays, or you know, uh, off office hours, um, up to 50,000 per transaction. 
I think we've kept you on the hot seat long enough, <laughs> Deputy Governor Merck. Um, and we've run over time. And I, I think I think it's my role. I think Eb, is Eb come back on, or is he in another webinar? I don't see Eb back with us. This is rare that he hasn't had a chance to speak in a, in a three-hour event. Um, so I, on behalf of AmCham. Um, I'd, I'd like to say we're excited about the, the future of the digital world in every aspect. And since <clears throat> nothing is free in life, the payments part of it is particularly important to our, our daily existence. Uh, it's definitely a different world from having to go to a bank, uh, having to do it with paper, being able to do it with digital money is fantastic. We need a better uh, uh, digital infrastructure in this country. Uh, people are working on that, including the senators. I wanna make a particular appeal uh, to the Senate that the telco sector be opened, which because there will be a vote on that in the Senate next week as to whether or not uh, telcos will continue to be considered as a public utility or can be treated as a public service open to 100% foreign investment. Uh, so more competition, more uh, better broadband, open access, these two legislative reforms that are in the Senate are important to our future just as much as all the good work that is being done by the regulatory bodies in the banks, the private sector. So I'd like to thank uh, uh, by first name, Mohammed and Henry uh, and, and Rep Juni and uh, that there are two Henrys, uh, <laughs> the two Henrys that were with us, uh, and uh, uh, Deputy Governor Mert, uh, Dr. Yu, if he's still with us, um, Anna, uh, you're back with us again, I see, thank you, uh, uh, Edwin and uh, Isfari, and my own staff, uh, Randall and, uh, uh, and Tin and, uh, and Mark, who all have supported us, and I hope I haven't let anybody out. This was an exciting event. And uh, some of us will see each other uh, at the end of the month in a TWG of the uh, Senate Finance Committee and uh, on other occasions. Uh, Salamat po to everybody and have a good Friday and weekend and stay safe. Stay safe, everyone. Thank you. Bye.